Okay, so welcome everyone to the USMA Step 1 lecture on the reproductive system, lecture number five by Dr. Hyderi for batch three. Thank you so much for joining the lecture. Hope you guys are doing well. If you guys can hear my voice, can I get a yes in the chat box, please? Thank you so much for joining the lecture. And uh, today we are going to discuss reproductive system. So, uh, so far till now, we have finished a lot of high yield topics and discussions from the reproductive system. Um, <clears throat> we began our discussion from yesterday. So, be so before I begin and I move forward, can we do a quick revision and recapitulation of the topics from yesterday? Yes or no? <coughs> Can we do a quick revision and recapitulation of the topics from yesterday? Yes or no? Yes, okay, good. So um, <clears throat> you, have a, you have a male patient who comes to your clinic. You have a male patient who comes to your clinic with his wife, unable to conceive a child. Um, the male patient has low sperm volume, testicular atrophy, widening of the hip, unicoid size, the patient also has um, long extremities and gynecomastia. What is your provisional diagnosis? Very good. You have another patient who comes to you, so who is a female patient with um, ovarian dysgenesis, bicuspid aortic valve, coarctation of the aorta, horseshoe kidney, very good. Okay, we have another patient who comes to you. The patient <coughs> is pregnant. The patient has uh, an intrauterine live male pregnancy. Um, the female has extreme virilizations. Which enzyme is deficient in the placenta? Very good. You have another phenotypically female patient who comes to your clinic with an adnexial mass. Okay. You have a female patient who comes to your clinic with an adnexial mass. And um, on examination, you find that the uterus ends in a blind pouch, right? And there are no ovaries. <laughs> and on top of that, this female, they have a um, high amount of testosterone. What is your, what is your provisional diagnosis? Very good. Endogen insensitivity. If you have another female patient who comes to your clinic with amenuria and you follow up the patient for two years, and in the next two years, you see that the patient has virilizations now without any um, pharmacological drugs. The patient has realizations with increase of age. What is your provisional diagnosis for this patient with amenuria? Very good. So, so if there is a female or a male patient who comes to your clinic with ambiguous genitalia, is androgen insensitivity syndrome a provisional diagnosis? Yes or no? Last answer, please. Last answer, please. Is androgen insensitivity syndrome a provisional diagnosis of a bigger syndrome? Well, androgen insensitivity syndrome is not probably a provisional diagnosis. Okay, very good. Is 5 alpha reductase a provisional diagnosis of ambiguous genitalia? Yes or no? Very good. Is Turner syndrome a uh, provisional diagnosis of ambiguous genitalia? Okay, how about um, 21 and 11 beta hydroxylase deficiency? Yes, okay, good. Okay. If you have another patient who is a pregnant patient who comes to you with severe third trimester bleeding with abdominal pain and hemorrhage. What is your diagnosis? 
at Brookshire Placenta. If you have another patient who comes to you with minimal bleeding on the third trimester without pain and no abdominal pain, but there is a little bit of bleeding, and you see very good, this is placenta previa. Very good. You have another patient who comes to you that after pregnancy, you see that this patient has a very difficult time in getting rid of the placenta. If that's the case, then what is the name of the condition? Placenta acrida syndromes, very good. If you have another patient and you see that during pervaginal examination, you see that the blood vessels of the umbilicus <laughs> are visualized. What is your provisional diagnosis? Basophilia. Very good. You have another patient who comes to you with absence of menstruation for two months. The patient now has severe abdominal pain, her vaginal bleeding, and hemodynamic shock. What is the first test that you will do for your patient? That's answer, please. HCP, what are you expecting? What do you think the problem is? Ectopic pregnancy, very good. You have another patient. You have the, it's a couple. Okay, why is Dr. Ethar the only one who is answering the questions? Uh, is, isn't there anyone else who is also um, interested in active participation? Yes or no? <laughs> I really appreciate Dr. Ethar for helping us out, but can I also get the other students to participate in the class, please? Yes, can I get some attention from uh, Dr. Singh, Dr. Odero, Dr. Alam, Dr. Nafisa, Dr. Nur Mohammed? Dr. VK and Dr. Tasneem. Am I not visible? Okay, Dr. Alam is also helping us out. So, except Dr. Ethan and Dr. Alam, the rest of the students, Dr. Otero, Dr. Nafisa, everyone else. Okay, please, I need you guys to participate in the class. I'm not even asking you to unmute yourself and tell me the answer by verbally. All you have to do is write down the answer in the chat box. Okay, are we ready? Yes or no? Pass answer, please. <clears throat> Are we ready? Yes or no? Yes, okay, okay. So you have a couple who comes to your clinic. They have been trying to conceive a child for a long period of time, okay? Now, the, the, the wife is pregnant because she did a home pregnancy test which came back positive, okay? So in your gynecological clinic, you did an <laughs> ultrasonogram and in your ultrasonogram, you find grape-like cystic clusters in the mother's uterus. What is your provisional diagnosis? The provisional diagnosis is high form mole. Very good. Okay. Very good. How many types of twins are there? How many types of twins do we have? Twin. Do we have? We have two types of twins. Very good. Two types. Number one is dizygotic, diphorionic. Another one is monozygotic, monozygotic, monophorionic. Okay. Now the thing is, when we say dizygotic, diphorionic, doesn't that mean that um, two eggs have been have been fertilized? Yes or no? The answer is yes. When I say monozygotic, does it mean one egg has been fertilized by one sperm and then it undergoes division? Yes or no? Yes, okay, good. If the division takes place on the third day, on the third day, what sort of a twin do we have? Fast answers, please. Very good. If the, if the division takes place on the sixth day, what sort of a twin do we have? Okay. If the division takes place, okay. What sort of a twin, what sort of twinning is very common? Which twinning is very common? That is 75% of monozygotics. Monochorionic, di, amniotic. Very good. So, very quickly, I need the help of one student who will tell me the difference between complete mole and partial mole. 
please say me in the chat box if you are that student. What is the difference between complete mole and partial mole? Fast answers, please. I need the help of one, one student. Yes, Dr. Alam and Dr. Ethar. Now, let me ask, let me ask someone else except Dr. Ethar and Dr. Alam. Who else is here? Who, who, who can help us out? Who else is here? Dr. Tasneem, thank you so much. Help us out, please. What is, what is the difference between complete mole and partial mole? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so the career track for the complete mole is uh, 46x6. Uh, and uh, for partial mole, it is uh, uh, or 46x5. For, for partial mole, it is 69. Okay, or xyy okay. uh, and uh, uh, now let me ask you some uh, important questions from the step one exam and then you can yeah, show sure. me the, the difference okay. in complete mole and partial mole which one is supposed to have fetal parts uh, that would be a partial mole partial mole which one is supposed to have a higher amount of beta hcd complete mole complete mole which one is supposed to have a higher risk of uh, converting itself into an invasive mole and cold carcinoma? Complete mole. Complete mole. Uh, which one is uh, supposed to have minimal trophoblastic proliferation? Minimal. Uh, uh, that would be partial mole. Perfect. Thank you so much. Really, really appreciate your help. Thank you. That's that's basically what it is. Complete mole, partial mole. Okay. So um, this mole thing. This highly deformed mole, should it have uh, uh, normally should should the mole have been a fetus, a zygote? Yes or no? The answer is the zygote. Should the mole have been a zygote or a fetus? The answer is yes. Instead of becoming a zygote or uh, basically a, a humanoid structure, we have the formation of a mole. Right. So that's it. Uh, did I share with everyone that three years ago I had no idea what what mole was? I just knew that, that this was a disease. Yes, okay, right. I had I had absolutely no clue. I had no clue. The reason being is because gynecol because uh, gynae and ops are my least favorite subject, but reproductive system as a whole is pretty interesting. But I didn't really think much into moles in general. I used to think it was some sort of a disease or whatever, but then I really thought about the disease when I was preparing for my exam. And I was like, what really is a mole? So, so mole is basically when an ovum gets fertilized by a sperm, <laughs> we should have a zygote. But instead, we have some sort of a problem in that process of fertilization, which gives rise to the cystic swelling of the chorionic villi and trophoblastic proliferation, giving rise to an abnormal structure instead of a zygote. That abnormal structure is called a mole or something like that. Now, depending if it's two sperm and one egg, we have a partial mole. If it's uh, one sperm and one enucleated egg, meaning that one egg that has no nucleus, then we call that a complete mole. Okay. Good, very good. So thank you so much, guys. I'm really proud of you all for uh, remembering all of the information over here. So we just did a very quick rapid review of um, the reproductive uh, pathology. Today, we are going to continue from over here and we will see how far we can go. One of the highest yield things that I want to talk about as soon as possible are your carcinomas. That is, uh, what are the different types of female reproductive carcinomas and what are the different types of male reproductive carcinomas? So that's it. Everything else over here, more or less, um, breast cancer, penile pathologies, and uh, scrotal pathologies and everything else, they're important, but not as important as pathologies related to carcinomas, okay? So that's it. So without wasting any more further time, can we begin the lecture for today? Yes or no? Is everyone ready? Okay, so thank you so much. Let's put our attention in the class and let's begin the lecture. So today we will begin our discussion with hypertension in pregnancy. And this is very, very, very important. Okay. Hypertension in pregnancy. Now, number one, why do we get, first and foremost, I just want to talk about very quickly, why do we get preeclampsia? Okay. Why do we get preeclampsia? This is a very important dis discussion because preeclampsia is very important. So preeclampsia means before eclampsia, as simple as that. Because the term eclampsia, E E C L A M P S I A, eclampsia stands for stands for seizures, right? So preeclampsia means 
all the syndromes that a pregnant woman goes through before she develops seizures. And that is a very difficult and a life-threatening condition, and it needs to be addressed immediately. Okay. So preeclampsia is basically a condition that happens in mothers when we have the placental blood vessels, when they are arranged very differently. So what happens is that when we have an ovum and a sperm, when they fertilize, we have a zygote. The zygote gets implanted in the posterior wall of the uterus. And then we have the formation of the chorionic villi. And from there, we have trophoblasts and syncytial trophoblasts, formation of the placenta and the arteries. If the arteries of the placenta are formed normally, then it's not a problem. But if the arteries of the placentas are formed at, with an abnormality, that is, they become like this, snake-like, or if they become spiraled, right? Will, will there be a lot of difficulty for the mother's <coughs> heart to push the blood to the placenta? Yes or no? The answer is yes, right? Because that is because whenever a mother is pregnant with a baby, the primary goal of the mother's body is uh, to supply more nutrition to the fetus than to the mother's tissue itself, right? That's, that's one of the biggest reasons why, if you can think about the fact why children are more attached to their mothers, that's because un un unknowingly, even without knowing, the mother's body decides to supply more nutrition to the placenta than to the mother itself. So when they do that, if the placental arteries are not compliant with the supplies of the nutrition to the fetus, what happens is the mother's heart has to work more to push the blood out to the spiral arteries of the placenta. As a result, the, the, the mothers, they develop hypertension. Not only do they develop hypertension, they also develop severe proteinuria because the high hydrostatic pressure of the, of the, of the blood vessel when we have hypertension, do we have high hydrostatic pressure in the blood vessels? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Do you guys remember our discussion? In the if this is a blood vessel over here, there are a couple of pressures that's working. We have hydrostatic pressure and oncotic pressure, and we have hydrostatic pressure and oncotic pressure outside, right? So if the mother's blood vessel has a high hydrostatic pressure due to hypertension, this leads to leaking of protein out from the blood vessels into the uh, kidney nephrons, which results in increase of your, of your glomerular filtration rate and proteinuria. Along with this, the mothers, they can develop end organ dysfunction. What are the end organ dysfunctions that we are talking about? This could affect the brains, this could affect the eyes, right? So uh, mothers, along with hypertension, proteinuria, do they have severe headache? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Do they have blurring of vision? Yes or no? The answer is yes, right? Can they develop cardiac arrest and, uh, and other problems? The answer is yes. Can they develop renal failure? The answer is yes, right? So end organ dysfunction. And all of this should happen before 20 weeks of gestation, okay? So this is preeclampsia. But there's another condition which predisposes preeclampsia, right? There's another condition that predisposes preeclampsia. What is that condition? Number one. The number one condition is gestational hypertension, which is more or less a benign, <laughs> a benign condition, right? So gestational hypertension is basically, uh, I said that it predisposes eclampsia. Uh, I, I apologize for that because, because that's a mistake. Gestational hypertension happens after 20 weeks of gestation, my apologies. But what I'm saying is, but what I'm saying is um, if a mother has hypertension from before, those mothers, are they more at risk of developing preeclampsia? Yes or no? That's, that's what I'm asking. The answer is, the answer is yes, right? For example, let's say that if there is a mother who, has, who already has primary hypertension, can that primary hypertension predispose to preeclampsia? The answer is yes, okay? But please, let's not confuse primary hypertension with gestational hypertension, like how I just did. Right? Gestational hypertension is a new onset of hypertension in mothers that happens after 20 weeks of gestation. Right? In these mothers, there is no pre-existing hypertension. Please remember that the dates are very, very important. Okay? The dates are very, very important. Even for pregnancy complications, please remember that the bleeding times are very, very important. For example, abruptual ab placenta, the bleeding happens in third trimester. Placenta previa, the bleeding happens in third trimester. 
because if there is a bleeding in the first trimester, do we think about placenta, placental abruption or placenta previa? The answer is no. We think about what? We, we think about spontaneous abortion. We think about incomplete abortion, right? We, we think about those things. So date in, in, the, in, your, in your reproductive uh, lectures, dates are very, very important. So gestational hypertension is hypertension in a mother that develops with who has had no previous hypertension and it develops after 20 weeks. These mothers, they only have hypertension and the hypertension is not severe enough to cause proteinuria or end organ damage, right? But the thing is, if we do not control this hypertension, this gestational hypertension, can it proceed to develop preeclampsia? Yes or no? The answer is yes. If we do not control the preeclampsia and the gestational hypertension, can that preeclampsia result to full-blown eclampsia? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay, so that's why this is very, very important. So even though I said that the, that gestational hypertension does not predispose, I mean, it usually happens after 20 weeks, but even if it does happen after, after 20 weeks, we still have to control this because this puts the mother at risk while developing preeclampsia, as simple as that. Now the, thing, now the thing is, in our pregnancy, can we use all types of drugs such as ACE inhibitors, ARB inhibitors? The answer is no. Why? Because ACE and ARB inhibitors are associated with renal dysgenesis in the fetus, right? So what do we use? We basically use, we basically use four antihypertensive in pregnancy, right? Four antihypertensive in pregnancy. The number one hypertension antihypertensive we will use is a calcium channel blocker known as nifedipine, right? The first one is nifedipine. The second one is alpha methyl dopa. The third one is labetalol, and the fourth one is hydralazine. Okay, so you can you can remember this either directly or from your previous memory. Or you can use a mnemonic such as hypertensive moms love nifedipine. I'm not really sure how much of this you would remember, but that's that. The best thing that is never choose ACE inhibitors or ARB inhibitors for hypertensive treatment in pregnancy, especially for US feminine step one. Okay. Because well, once again, ACE and ARBs, they are related with renal dysgenesis. Next one is preeclampsia. Preeclampsia, as I have just said, the pathology, due to abnormal formation of spiral arteries, the mother's heart has to work more to push the blood out. As a result, they develop severe hypertension. It usually um, happens before 20 weeks of gestation, but throughout the pregnancy, does the mother have the risk of developing preeclampsia even after 20 weeks? The answer is yes. Okay. Whenever during the entire nine month course of pregnancy, if the mother's heart is having a very difficult time pushing the blood out, then that puts the mother at risk of developing preeclampsia and something like that. It is, uh, the incidence is high with history of previous preeclampsia, chronic hypertension, diabetes, for example. Can anyone tell me why is diabetes associated with uh, preeclampsia? Can anyone tell me why? Okay. In diabetes, do we also have, um, do we also have a, a little bit of arteriosclerosis. Do you guys know what arteriosclerosis is? Arteriosclerosis is thickening of the arteries. Yes or no? Do you also have thickening of the arteries? The answer is yes. Why do we get thickening of the arteries? Is it because that patients who has diabetes, they have a high blood glucose level? The answer is yes. So what is the relation with high blood glucose level and blood vessels? When we have high blood glucose level, there's a process known as NEG, non-enzymatic glycation, right? Non-enzymatic glycation is when we have a uh, deposition of this glucose substances throughout the entire blood vessel. So, so have you guys ever seen sugar line up a border? Does it get thick? Yes or no? The answer is yes, right? So when they get thick, what would happen to the blood vessels? Are they going to get hard and difficult to put the blood through? The answer is yes. So can it also cause the same amount of resistance as spiraling of the arteries? The answer is yes, right? So that's that. So just so diabetes is also another high yield thing. Chronic kidney disease is another thing. Autoimmune disorders such as anti-phospholipid syndrome. Can anyone tell me why is anti-phospholipid syndrome associated with preeclampsia? Anti-phospholipid syndrome, is this a hypercoagulable disease? Yes or no? Does it make the blood very thick and coagulable? The answer is yes, right? Anti-phospholipid syndrome is a hypercoagulable disease. So the same pathology goes, if there's hypercoagulability of the arteries, it will, there will be a very difficult time for the heart to push 
the blood through the placental arteries, resulting in hypertension, end organ damage, and proteinuria, as in blood. There are some complications of preeclampsia, right? <laughs> well, what are the complications of preeclampsia? We have placental abruption, and that makes sense because if there's extreme hypertension, and we have the, the, the placenta coming off because not only is the placenta weak because of the spiraling of the arteries and the hypercoagulability, and also because of the uh, diabetes and everything else, the, if the high amount of blood flow, can, can this result in the placenta coming off from the uterus? The answer is yes, right? Next one is, next one is coagulopathy, disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, why? Can we get the release of tissue factors uh, from the ruptured placental arteries? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So whenever tissue factors, they enter into the blood vessel from the ruptured placental arteries that we can get coagulopathy. We can also get renal failure. That makes sense because the kidneys, they are draining out a lot of protein. We can get pulmonary edema. Why do we get pulmonary edema? For the same reason, we get hypertension due to high hydrostatic pressure and low oncotic pressure. Do you realize that a mother who has preeclampsia she has all the factors that are favoring leakage of the blood vessels, yes or no? Because not only does she have a high hydrostatic pressure, she also has low oncotic pressure, right? Because the proteins are going out and the blood vessels, they have a high pressure. So all of this, these two things, they will favor leaking of fluid. And whenever, whenever fluid leaks out, the lungs are one of the most affected areas. So pulmonary edema can happen. Uh, patients can also get uterine placental insufficiency, and that this may lead to eclampsia. Or one of the highest yield thing is HELP syndrome. HELP, HELP stands for hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets. Um, there's another high yield thing. I just want to talk to you guys about this over here. In your NBME exam and your step one exam, you will face a question. If this is the placental artery, for example, and let's say this placental artery is thickened or whatever due to uh, coagulation, diabetes, due to spiraling. When the mother's blood goes through this, the RBCs, can they get disrupted, yes or no? Because they have to force themselves out through this narrow radius of the blood vessels. Can the structure get disrupted? The answer is yes. What is the name of this disrupted structure that we see in, um, pre in preeclampsia? The answer is the structure is known as helmet cells or in another word, we call this schistocytes. Yes or no? We call this schistocytes. Are we clear? Yes or no? So there's a question in your NBME and your step one exam that what is the type of RBC that we see in HELP syndrome? HELP, H-E-L-P. The type of RBC that we see in HELP syndrome is schistocytes. Have I made myself clear? Yes or no? What is the type of RBC that we see in... Um, Preeclampsia and eclampsia, the answer is we, we can see schistocytes. As simple as that. Okay. Okay, good. Now, um, treatment of, of preeclampsia. Preeclampsia treatment is by what? We, we treat it by antihypertensive. We give nifedipine, labetalol, methyl dopa. And do we give, do, do we give uh, magnesium sulfate? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Can anyone tell me how does magnesium help in um, prevention of seizure? Can anyone tell me how? Now, let me tell you something. Magnesium in high amount will cause hyporeflexia. Have I, made, have I made myself clear? Magnesium in high amount will cause hyporeflexia. Meaning that, can we assume that magnesium is an inhibitory ion? Yes or no? Magnesium as an ion, this has inhibitory functions, right? So have you guys ever had a patient who had hypomagnesemia? If they have hypomagnesemia, if the magnesium level in the blood falls really low, do we have hyporeflexia or hyperreflexia? We have hyperreflexia, right? And hypomagnesemia, hypomagnesemia is very highly associated with calcium levels because calcium levels are, uh, they directly affect the magnesium level, right? And another thing is, if we give excessive magnesium sulfate to a patient from outside, will they be in an excitatory state or will they be in an inhibitory state? The answer is they will be in an inhibitory state, okay? So magnesium as an ion is an inhibitory ion. That's why we would like to give our patients magnesium sulfate, magnesium sulfate to prevent the seizure. Another thing is, can we also give magnesium sulfate in post-op's point? Yes or no? The answer is, 
The answer is yes, yes, yes. Do you guys remember what is Torsad's day point? What is Torsad's day point? Dr. Ita, what is Torsad's day point? It, uh, this is not arrhythmia. This is not QT interval. There's a very distinct definition of Torsad's day point. Okay. Do we say torsades de point is the appearance of the EKG of the heart when we see polymorphic ventricular tachycardia? Yes or not? What do we mean by polymorphic ventricular tachycardia? Something like this, right? Right, okay. Do we see this in antiarrhythmic drugs, for example, uh, drug, um, for example, we see this in, um, first group of antiarrhythmics and the third group of antiarrhythmics. We can see them in antibiotics, right? We can see them with haloperidols. We can see them with ondansetrons, right? Right, PCAs, exactly. So that's it. So do we also get magnesium sulfate in these patients? The answer is yes. Why? For the same effect, for the inhibitory effect, as simple as that. Okay. Oh, now. The next sequelae of preeclampsia is obviously eclampsia, but number one complication of preeclampsia is eclampsia. So, so what is eclampsia? Eclampsia is basically all the signs and symptoms of preeclampsia with seizure, with seizure. This is a very difficult condition to recover the patient from. If the mother suffers from eclampsia, the child also goes to severe fetal distress. Isn't there a possibility that when the mother is having those seizure attacks, the child is completely devoid of nutrition and oxygen, yes or no? The answer is yes, because if you think about it, if the mother's body is undergoing seizure, at that point, will the mother's heart and the mother's brain try to save the mother itself? Yes or not? The answer is yes, right? They will not, they will not supply the nutrition to the fetus. So, so while the body of the mother is trying to save the mother itself, what would happen to the fetus? There's a possibility that the fetus can undergo severe distress and have intrauterine fetal death. So, and mothers as a whole, they can get stroke, hemorrhage, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and eclampsia. Whenever a mother undergoes eclampsia, do we do we do do we do immediate uh, cesarean section and delivery? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay. And after we do the the termination, do we also uh, supply the mother with antihypertensive and magnesium sulfate? The answer is yes. Okay, have I made myself clear? Yes or no? Does anyone know how we administer magnesium sulfate to the to mothers? This is all important for step one, but just in case, if you guys have ever asked about this on a on your residency rotation or something like this, how do we how do we administer magnesium sulfate? <clears throat> Can anyone tell me? Slow with monitoring. Ten. No. Let me tell you something. First and foremost, the the amount that we gave is ten. Okay, we have the amount that we gave is 10. And we divide that amount by into six and four. So six plus four is 10. The six one, we divide it into three. So for three, uh, each three, um, three, three milliliters of the magnesium, magnesium sulfate, each of those three are administered intramuscularly into the gluteus muscle. Yes or no? Fast answers, please. Okay. Each of those three milliliters, they are administered in the gluteus muscle. So after we administer three and three, how much have we administered fast? How much have we administered fast answers, please? We have administered six. So that leaves four, yes or no? That leaves behind four, right? So that four is divided into two portions, two, two. And then we administer that four IV very slowly over the next 10 minutes. Have I made myself clear? Yes or no? Okay. Okay, good. So we do that and we try to see if we can recover the mother and that's that. So that is all about eclampsia. Now let's move forward to HELP syndrome. What is HELP syndrome? HELP syndrome is hemolysis with elevated liver enzyme and, and platelets. This is basically a sequelae of preeclampsia when what happens is that due to the thickening of the blood vessels or due to the abnormal structure of the placental arteries, will the blood vessels break, will the RBCs break down when they pass through these blood vessels? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So they, so do we have hemolytic anemia, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Can okay, just give me one second, please?
Okay. Okay, so my apologies. Let's begin once again. So we, we were talking about help syndrome. So help syndrome is basically preeclampsia with um, help syndrome is basically preeclampsia with one of the sequelae of preeclampsia, which is when we have a thickening of the blood vessels, when the RBCs, they pass through this, they break down. And when they break down, we have microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, right? So, but the thing is, whenever we have microangiopathic hemolytic anemia and um, this microangiopathic hemolytic, hemolytic anemia, when we break the RBCs down, isn't there a possibility that um, this bro broken down RBCs will also result in breaking down of the platelets? Yes or no? The answer is yes, right? So platelets also get, get consumed. So we get hemolysis, we get low platelets. Why do we get elevated liver enzymes? We get elevated elevated liver enzymes because do you guys remember preeclampsia affects all the organs of the body? So we have hypertension, proteinuria with end organ damage, yes or no? So if the end organ damage is in the liver, right? Then spe specifically we get help syndrome, as simple as that. This may occur in the absence of hypertension and proteinuria and the blood smear shows schistocytes. This is very, very important. And another one is this can lead to hepatic subcapsular hematomas, which can rupture and cause severe hypertension. This is not important, but the treatment is immediate delivery. So that's that. Okay, so that's all. I think uh, you guys have understood help syndrome, yes or no? Do we need to discuss this any further? Do we need to discuss help syndrome any further? Okay, good. Okay, another one is a very high yield thing, very, very high yield thing over here. A lot of students do not give this syndrome and a lot of importance, but the mother, uh, when they have a, a baby developing in their gravid uterus, right? Isn't there a possibility that, for example, let's say that if the mother, um, for example, in which side do we have the inferior vena cava, the right side or the left side? Which one? The inferior vena cava is on which side, the right side or the left side? We have the inferior vena cava on the right side, right? So for example, let's say that if there is a mother who has um, a gravid uterus, right? If, they, if there is a mother who has a gravid uterus and the mother, when they are sleeping, Let's say that they sleep on the right side. When they sleep on the right side, isn't there a possibility that the gravid uterus can push on the inferior vena cava? Yes or no? Can press down on the inferior vena cava? The answer is yes. If the mother's gravid uterus presses down on the inferior vena cava, do we have more venous return or less venous or less venous return? The answer is we have less venous return. So if we have less venous venous return, what would happen to the overall cardiac output? The overall the overall cardiac output and also decrease, yes or no? Because if the venous return is decreased then the cardiac output is decreased. So what happens is that if in majority of the cases, the inferior vena cava is the one that gets compressed. You know why it, inferior vena cavas are more compressed than the abdominal aorta? The reason is because veins in general, is it more easy for veins to collapse? The answer is yes, right? It's, it's more difficult for arteries to collapse because arteries, they, are, um, they, they have a more rigid structure. Since veins are more easier to collapse, when the mother lies on the left side, we usually do not get any symptoms or any patient or any US assembly step one question with aortic compression. We get majority of the question with inferior vena cable compression. And they basically ask you, what is the name of this syndrome? This name is, this, the name of the syndrome is supine hypotensive syndrome. Have I made myself clear, yes or no? Supine hypotensive syndrome, okay? So that's that. So that's about it, okay? Now the next one is gynecological tumor epidemiology, which I will start in one second. Before I do this, can I ask you guys to read hypertension and pregnancy very quickly for one minute? And let me, and let me know if you guys have any problems from, from over here, okay? <clears throat> and then after that, I'm gonna start gynecological tumor. So one minute on the clock, let's do this. After that, I'll, I'll ask you questions and then I'll move forward. Okay, thank you so much.
Okay. Now, if we have hypertension before uh, 20 weeks of gestation, along with proteinuria and end organ failure, what is the name of the syndrome? Can I just please? The name of the syndrome is? If we have hypertension before 20 weeks of gestation, if we have hypertension, if we, uh, if we have hypertension before 20 weeks of gestation, along with uh, protein urea and end organ damage, what is the name of this condition? Can I just please? No, no, no. Hypertension before 20 weeks of gestation with protein urea and end organ damage. Whenever we have hypertension with proteinuria and end organ damage, regardless of the timing, regardless of the timing, this is, this is preeclampsia. Have I made myself clear? Yes or no? Regardless of the timing, whenever hypertension comes to you with proteinuria and end organ damage, this is preeclampsia. Okay. But usually preeclampsia is more common at which timing? Preeclampsia is more common before 20 weeks or after 20 weeks? That's chances weeks. After 20 weeks. There you go. If we have hypertension, new onset of hypertension without high proteinuria and end organ damage. What is the name of this hypertension? Without proteinuria, just it's not hypertension, there you go. What is the number one treatment for eclampsia? Press chance, please. The number one treatment for eclampsia is magnesium sulfate, very good. If there's a mother who has hypertension by sleeping on the right side or the left side, what is the name of this condition? The name of this condition is? Supine hypertensive syndrome. Okay. Okay. Supine hypertensive syndrome. Let's move forward to the gynecological tumors and their incidence. Okay. So let's talk about the gynecological tumors and their incidence. Now, gynecological tumors, let's talk about their incidence in the US, meaning what type of gynecological tumors in the US are more common. In US, do we have a more uh, higher prevalence of cervical vaccination? Yes or no? The answer is yes, right? So in the US, the, the cervical cancer is actually much lower, much, much lower than endometrial and ovarian cancer. But in the US, mothers are also exposed to uh, a very bad diet, yes or no? The answer is yes. Are they also exposed to high BMI? The answer is Yes. Are they exposed to familial hypertension? The answer is yes. Are they exposed to familial diabetes? The answer is yes. All of these hypertension, BMI, diabetes, is it a predisposal to develop uterine carcinoma? The answer is yes. That's why always remember this. Endometrial carcinoma in the US is much higher. After endometrial, you have ovarian carcinoma and then cervical carcinoma. Okay. This is actually asked in your step one exam. <clears throat> Very important. Okay. Cervical cancer is more common in, in uh, third world countries where vaccination is not as common. So that, and what is the prognosis? The prognosis is that cervical cancer has the best prognosis when you compare this with endometrial and ovarian cancer and ovarian cancer has the worst prognosis. That, that makes sense. Okay. Now let's talk about some pathologies that are related to the vulva. Is everyone ready? Yes or no? Is everyone ready? Okay. Good. So, um, wait, wait, one second. Okay. So basically, when we talk about uh, the vulvar pathology, there are a couple of diseases that uh, we have to talk about. And from all of these diseases, I just want to talk about very quickly. Um, which ones are more important for the step one exam, which ones are not important for the step one exam. Okay. Now, let's talk about the neoplastic and non-neoplastic vulvar, vulvar pathology. When I say non-neoplastic, what I basically mean is inflammatory diseases. The number one is a Bartholin's gland cyst or a Bartholin's gland abscess. Very, very important for your exam, for your step one exam. Now, what are Bartholin glands? What are the Bartholin glands? The, the, the Bartholin glands are glands that we have on uh, bilateral side of the vaginal opening. What they do is that they secrete fluid and they help with the overall lubrication of the female reproductive system, right? So my question is, if this is a gland, if this is a gland in the female reproductive system, and if this is responsible for lubrication, 
Uh, is it responsible for secretion of mucus? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So the next question is, if there is any sort of obstruction to the opening of the mucosal gland, right, of the mucus gland, can there be buildup of mucusy fluid in, in the duct, the, the blood hole in the duct? Yes or no? The answer is yes. And the number one medical principle is, if there is any duct in your body which gets blocked by any secretion, will there be inflammation and infection? The answer is yes, right? If there's any tube or any duct in your body that gets blocked in whichsoever, then this can result in accumulation of pathogens and infection. So that's exactly what happens. So Bartholin glands are glands that can cause accumulation. Um, they are due to blockage of the Bartholin gland duct by accumulation of fluid. This may, this may lead to abscess and obstruction. It's usually in reproductive age of the females. So we usually see this in the reproductive age. Why? Because Bartholin glands, they secrete the fluid in response to estrogen. For example, in after menopause, do we get um, vaginitis? I mean, do we get dry vaginas? Yes or no? Or atrophic vaginas? The answer is yes. Why? Because after menopause, the estrogen level falls severely and they, under the influence of low estrogen level, what happens is that the Bartholin's men, they secrete less fluid. So very quickly, I just want to talk about a couple of things over here. Always remember this. For example, if this is the uh, female reproductive system, right? If this is the opening of the female reproductive system, you have the glans clitoris over here. Okay, you have the urethral, urethral orifice over here. You have the vaginal opening over here. And where do you have the Bartholin's gland? The Bartholin's glands are secreted. I mean, they are, they are present in the lower segment. Always remember this, they are, they, are, they are present in the lower portions, lower over here in one side and in a, another side. And with the help of a duct, they are supplying the fluid. Why is it important to know where the Bartholin glands are located? Because isn't there a possibility that we can get obstruction of another gland over here? The answer is yes. There are, there are a lot of different types of mucus secreting glands that we get, but the Bartholin glands abscess will always be on the lower lateral side. side. Okay, Lower and lateral. Are we clear? Yes or no? The answer is okay. The answer is yes. Now, next one that I want to talk about is lichen sclerosis. What is lichen sclerosis? Lichen sclerosis is this condition over here. This condition is lichen sclerosis. As you can see in this condition, you have the um, vaginal parts that are, that are very thinned out and they are fibrotic and they are sclerosed, meaning that, they're thick, that they are thickened, meaning that the epidermal, we have thinning of the epidermis, but thickening of the lower layers of the, of the dermis. So what happens is these patients, they have white plaques that are red or violet in color. And the problem is that these white plaques, that uh, they are very uh, itchy. They can cause severe pain during sexual intercourse. That is uh, this pioneer. And we usually see this in postmenopausal female or premenopausal female. Have I made myself clear? In premenopausal female and postmenopausal female. Why do we see this in premenopausal and postmenopausal? Because of the fact that in both of these conditions, the estrogen level is very low. Yes, if the estrogen level is very low, do we have appropriate vaginal lubrication? Yes or no? The answer is no, right? So doesn't this put the vagina at increased risk of wear and tear and thinning out and uh, getting thickened? Yes or no? Fast answers, please. The answer is yes. Okay, so how do we treat this condition? Fast answers. How do we treat this condition? Do we treat this condition with supplying the, with, uh, with, with topical estrogen and topical uh, steroids, yes or no, such as clobetasol? The answer is yes. Have I made myself clear? Okay. The next one. The next one that I want to talk about is ly lichen simplex chronicus. Lichen simplex chronicus is a simple hyperplasia of the bulbar skin where we see leathery, thick bulbar skin with enhanced skin marking. The difference between this one and this one is that lichen sclerosis, right? Lichen sclerosis is something that we see in postmenopausal and premenopausal women only, more or less. But lichen simplex chronicus is basically a condition where due to uh, excessive friction 
for example, due to friction, we have the development of thickening of the bulbar skin. This is a benign condition. This is a precancerous condition. Have I made myself clear? Yes or no? Lichen sclerosis in especially postmenopausal female, they are a precancerous condition because they, this can lead to squamous cell carcinoma. But lichen simplex chronicus is something where we see leukoplex, meaning that formation of white plaques due to chronic rubbing or chronic frictions or due to any other uh, procedures or due to uh, wearing some sort of a cloth that causes friction rubs. So that, that's that sort of a thing. From over here, you have these two diseases that are excessively high yield that will be asked way more. This one is not that important. So I'm gonna use my blue pen for this. Okay, next one is neoplastic, vulvar neoplasm. So neoplasm means that you have a vulvar carcinoma, something like this, right? So this is a vulvar carcinoma. This can happen specifically <clears throat> due to HPV, especially the high risk HPV, HPV 16 and 18. Okay, HPV 16 and 18. The risk factors are that these patients, they have multiple partners, which puts them at risk. For example, if, if there is a female who participates in polygamy, right? They get involved with multiple people and that puts them at risk of contracting the HPV much easier. Another one is early coitarchy. What is early coitarchy? That is females who gets involved in sexual intercourse in a very early age, right? If females get if females, if they get involved in the sexual activity in a very early age, do they have proper protection of their reproductive system by their immunity? Yes or no? The answer is no, right? Because it takes some time for the immunity to develop around the local regions. And in the early stages, if they get involved with sexual activity, they can get infected with HPV and, the, and their immune system will not be able to fight it. So the HPV stays and it causes the development of the valvular carcinoma. Okay, I just want to share with you guys uh, one simple thing over here. Um, give me one second. Just want to share how. Just give me one second. Okay. Okay, so what I'm saying is that um, I basically want to share uh, one simple thing with you guys. That is, does anyone know how HPV uh, 16 and 18, how do they cause the, the carcinoma? Does anyone know how? Does anyone know how HPV 16 and 18, how do they cause Carcinoma. Okay. Now, let me tell you something over here very quickly. Okay. So, HPV, what it does is that HPV 16 and 18, okay. Let me tell you something over here. HPV 16 and 18, they work by like this HPV. So, you know, like how we say that there are low risk HPV and high risk HPV. Why do we say that there are high risk HPVs? For example, 16 and 18, what they do is that um, these two strains of the virus, they go and they affect the nucleus of the cell and they induce the, um, you know, like how when a virus goes and it affects the nucleus of a the cell, they can disrupt the, the protein synthesis of the normal cell. Yes or no, that's that please. The answer is yes, right? So what happens is that these two viruses, they specifically go, 16 and 18, they infect the host cell the whole cell means our cell, they invade the nucleus and they decrease um, or they cause mutation of a protein called E6. When we get mutation of a protein known as E6 by these 16 and 18, what happens is that we get inactivation of a very high yield gene. This is known as P57. If anyone knows what P57 is, P57 and P53. If, if, if anyone knows what P57 and P53 is, P57 and P53 are tumor suppressor genes. If we do not have P57, P53, right? Isn't there a possibility that we can have excessive growth of tumors? Yes or no? The answer is. 
Okay. The answer is yes. Okay. So there are two genes. So you, you have E16 and 18. 16 is for six and 18 is for E7. Okay. So we get E6 that is responsible for blocking P53 and E7 that will block RB gene. Now, RB gene is another sort of a tumor suppressor gene that is responsible for preventing the formation of two types of carcinomas, that is retinoblastoma and osteosarcoma, right? So if we have no P53 and, and decreased activity of the RB gene, which are the, two, which are the two tumor suppressor genes, can we have excessive growth of tumors by the HPV, yes or no? The answer is yes, okay. Very quickly, can anyone repeat the information which I have just which I have just given for um, the HPVs, E6 and E7? Can anyone repeat the information, please, very quickly? Yes, Dr. Itar, please. Thank you so much for helping out. Um, yes, the human question four, 16 and 18. 16 will activate which gene? Uh, 16 will will induce the E6 uh, gene. 18, 18 will. Uh, the seven, E7. E7. So E6 activation results in inactivation of which tumor suppressor gene? B53 tumor suppressor B53 and B57. And, and uh, RB, ah, my uh, apologies, E7 will in, inactivate which gene? The retinoblastoma gene. Retinoblastoma gene. Very good. Okay, so thank you so much. So due to the presence of these uh, 16 and 18, if we get infected with this, then we can get vulvar carcinoma. Okay. So that's that. We will talk about this in details when we study microbiology. But just for now, since I remembered, uh, I just thought of sharing this with you guys. So let's move forward. Now, let's talk about another sort of a condition. This is extra mammary Paget's disease. What is extra mammary Paget's disease? This is intraepithelial adenocarcinoma. Intraepithelial adenocarcinoma that we see. Um, for example, this is actually uh, a Paget's disease. So this is carcinoma in C2, low risk of underlying carcinoma. This presents with pruritus, erythema, crusting, and ulcers. This is not important. Okay. Extra mammary Paget's disease is basically, uh, we, we say Paget's disease, they are more common, especially in the um, especially in the breasts, right? So if we have extra mammary, that means that the same type of adenocarcinomas, if they take place in the vulvar area, then we call this extra mammary. So this is not very important. So I'm going to move forward. Okay. So what is the number one uh, risk factor for vulvar carcinoma? The answer is HPV. Okay. Oh, by the way, a uh, female who is a smoker and a female who is a non-smoker, who has more risk of developing HPV? That's answer, please. A female who's a smoker or a female who's a non-smoker, who has more risk of developing HPV? Why? Why do smokers have increased risk of developing HPV? Smoking in general decreases one very specific sort of immunity, right? Smoking in general decreases one very specific sort of immunity that, that helps prevent the growth and migration of the HPVs. So always remember this, for USM step one exam, for risk factor wise for vulvar carcinoma, if they say, if they ask you, which is a very, well, what is a very high yield risk factor? Number one is absence of vaccination. Number two is multiple sexual partner. Number three is smoking. Smoking is very high yield. So please write down smoking over here. Are we clear, yes or no? Press chance, please. Okay. For your USMLE step one and step two CK, vulvar carcinoma, vaginal carcinoma, whichever carcinoma there is that is involved with HPV, smoking is a very high yield risk factor. Always remember this. Let's talk about imperforated hymen very quickly. What is imperforated hymen? That means incomplete degeneration of the central portion of the hymen. So what happens is there is a, for example, in your US 70 step one exam, you will have a patient who comes to you, who comes to you presenting with amenorrhea, right? And when you do a vaginal examination, you see that there is a bluish bulge. There's a bluish bulge, meaning that, for example, if, I mean, the hymen is usually the opening of the vaginal canal, right? The hymen is usually degenerated with age or with sexual intercourse. So what happens is, let's say that there is a female in whom menstruation has begun, but the hymen is not degenerated. So isn't there a possibility that the menstrual blood can accumulate uh, behind the hymen? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So when we have something like this, we, we call this hematocolpos. Hematocolpos, meaning that he means blood, colpos means the, uh, the um, 
uh, my meaning the Latin word for vulva and vagina is colpos, right? So hematocolpos is accumulation of blood behind the hymen. In these cases, do we do a simple incision? Yes or no? The answer is yes. How do we give the incision for uh, breaking down the hymen? We give an incision in the form of an X or a cross. Have I made myself clear? Yes or no? Why do we give the incision in the form of a cross or an X? We do this because we want to make sure that the hymen doesn't get fibrosed and then and, and gets regenerated again. So that's why we do this. Have I made myself clear? Yes or no? Yes, very good. Let's move forward. Next one is vaginal tumors. What is vaginal tumors? We have squamous cell carcinoma, clear cell carcinoma, and sarcoma botrytis. Squamous cell carcinoma is one of the most highest CO vaginal carcinomas. Okay. The, it's usually secondary to cervical carcinoma. Primary vaginal carcinoma is rare. What do we mean? This means that vaginal carcinomas are very, very important in the terms of squamous cell carcinoma, but Whenever we have a vaginal squamous cell carcinoma, that's usually because this carcinoma came to you, came to the vagina from the vulva first. So the primary tumor is in the vulva and the vagina is the local metastasis, as simple as that. Because is it really difficult for the vagina to get, um, to get infected with HPV before the vulva? The answer is yes, because if the reproductive system has to get infected with HPV, then the vulva is the first organ that will get exposed. So obviously there will be growth in the vulva first and then it will spread to the vagina, as simple as that. Next, next one is clear cell adenocarcinoma. Clear cell adenocarcinoma is not very important until and unless if there is a developing, uh, if there is a developing fetus that was exposed to estrogen, especially diethyl steel vesterol in utero. If there is a mother who is taking diethyl steel vesterol, which is extremely rare in the US, then the, then the developing fetus can develop clear cell adenocarcinoma, which is not important. So, so for this, I'm gonna use my blue pen. Do you think that we still give diethyl steel vesterol in the US? The answer is absolutely not. So if we do not give diethyl steel vesterol, do we get clear cell adenocarcinomas a lot? Yes or no? The answer is no. So if, if it's not that common, will they be asked in the step one exam more? The answer is no. Okay. Next one is sarcoma boitroides. This is embryonic uh, rhabdomyosarcoma. It affects females less than four years of age, spindle shaped cells, desmin positive, grape like polypoid mass emerging from the vagina. Not important. Okay. Not important. But if you have to remember this, for example, whenever I say grape like clusters hanging down from the uterus, do we think, do, do we think immediately about hereditary mole? Yes or no? The answer is. Yes, right? We think about molar pregnancy. But so the next time, if you hear grape-like clusters coming down per vaginally in a female less than four years of age, let's say there is a difficult question like this. Can you remember this information to make your diagnosis for sarcoma boitroides? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Have I made myself clear? Will you be asked about sarcoma boitroides? The answer is no. If you were asked, if you were asked, if you ever see a question where you see, where they're telling you that there's a grape-like cluster that is hanging down per vaginally, then that is your um, sarcoma. What do I this? Have I made myself clear, yes or no? Yes, okay, good. So that's all about the vulvar pathology. Now let's move on to cervical pathology. Okay, can we take a small uh, two minute break before we begin cervical pathology, yes or no? Okay. Even though we studied two pages, there were a lot of information in these two pages. Okay. So while uh, we take the break, can we all, can we also ask you to simply read through the pages if you want, and then maybe I can ask you some very quick questions and I can move forward. Okay. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. The two minute break. Thank you so much.
Okay. <clears throat> uh, quick question. Is everyone ready? Yes or no? If we have a patient who comes to you uh, with a female who's a re of reproductive age and there is excessive pain in the lower part of the reproductive system, and you see that there are there is one unilateral lower left vaginal swelling, what is your pathology? What is your traditional diagnosis? Bartholin cyst, very good. If you have another postmenopausal or premenopausal female who has severe thickening of the malbar area with erosion and um, pruritus, what is your diagnosis? Black and sclerosis. If there's another female who comes to you with a history of multiple uh, polygamy, the female has an exophytic mass in the bulbar area. Which microorganism is responsible for this? Press chances, please. HPV. HPV, which two? 16 or 18 or so low risk HPV? The answer is 16 and 18. 16 and 18, how do they work? Do they induce E6 and E7? The answer is yes. When they induce E6 and E7, which two genes are they preventing from functioning? P53 and which one? RB gene. As a result, do we have excessive growth of tumors? Yes or no? The answer is? The answer is yes. Okay, good. So while I was stretching about the importance and how E6 and E7 work, I completely forgot that they already have this mentioned over here. Okay. So I thought that it would not be mentioned in first aid. I'm not sure why, because I learned this myself from UWorld when I was preparing for my exam. So <clears throat> if you ever want to read how they do it, it's actually written over here in the survival pathology. Okay. So let's talk about survival pathology very quickly. Survival pathology is very, very important, especially dysplasia and carcinoma in situ. So cervical pathology is the disordered epithelial growth. It begins at the basal layer of the squamous columnar junction, right? So based on the extension of the pathology, right, we have a couple of high yield things. We have CIN, meaning cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, one. How do we say one, two, or three? We say one, two, or three. For example, let's say that this is the cervical canal. If the upper one third is affected <clears throat> with the neoplasia, we call this CIN1. If the middle one third is affected with the upper one third, we call this CIN2. If the entire uh, one, if the entire third of the cervix is affected, then we call this CIN3. After CIN3, what is the next sequelae? So for example, this is CIN1. From CIN1, they will go to CIN2. Then from then for two, that they will go to CIN3. And then after CIN3, what will happen? Carcinoma in situ. After, if you do not stop carcinoma in situ, can we get full on cervical carcinoma? The answer is yes. Okay. So this is the sequelae. Okay. This is the sequel. So that's that. If we do an intervention at this level, can we prevent cervical carcinoma? The answer is yes. If we do an intervention at this level, can we do, can we prevent carcinoma? The answer is yes. So isn't this why we advise females to undergo pap smears every year? Yes or no? More or less. The answer is the answer is yes, right? Because it's better to catch the cervical carcinoma in a very early stage, because it's if you catch this in a very early stage, the cure rate of survival is one, give me one second. Can everyone hear my voice? Yes or no? One second. <laughs> oh. No. No. When, when we do pap smears, do we usually take the smear from the squamous columnar junction? The answer is yes. So, when, so whenever we do a pap smear, we have to do the pap smear from the squamous columnar junction. This junction is known as the transformation zone. And this is the zone from where there is initiation of the process of carcinoma. You have two high-risk viruses, HPV 16 and 18. And by the same mechanism, I have mentioned at least three times till now, there's E6 and E7, PP53 and RB. 
we have the formation of cervical carcinoma. Now, I want to bring your attention very quickly to this one single thing. This one single thing that I want to talk about is this structure over here. This structure is known as a poilocyte. Poilocytes are very important. Poilocytes are cells which appears wrinkled like this. There's wrinkling of the cell and the center nucleus looks like a raisin. You, you know what a raisin is, right? We have this in our desserts every other day, right? So raisin. So this is a raisinoid nucleus with a peri perinuclear halo. What do we mean by that by a perinuclear halo? Do you guys know what a halo is? A halo is basically, for example, if this is a light, you know, like how there is a white light that surrounds the light, yes or no? The answer is yes. For example, angels, you know, like how angels, they have a halo around them in, in movies and cartoons, yes or no? The answer is yes, right? So as you can see, this nucleus, this structure, this has a wrinkled shape, right? They have a central raisinoid nucleus and the surrounding area is white. This uh, sort of this description of the cell is excessively high yield. This is very important for students who are willing to score in the higher ranks because they describe the cell and they ask you which cell are they talking about? They're talking about a poilocyte. Okay. So it's typically it's asymptomatic uh, or meaning that cervical carcinoma in early stages is very asymptomatic. In extensive stages, patients will come to you uh, with uh, painful sexual intercourse, uh, post intercourse bleeding, right? And another very high yield, um, high yield sign symptom is that patients will come to you with spotting. Do you, you know what spotting is? Spotting is minor spot bleeding that happens in between menstruation, right? That is, they will come to you with vaginal spotting. Whenever, always, always remember this. If there is any female who comes to you with vaginal spotting or vaginal bleeding in between their menstruation, in between their menstruation, you should immediately do a pap smear and a transvaginal ultrasonogram or a colposcope to see if there's anything wrong, okay? Risk factors, as I have just said, HPV, multiple sexual partners, smoking, very important. Okay, so these are the ones, and then immunocompromise is another one. Have I made myself clear, yes or no? CIN1 means upper one third of the cervical canal getting infected, okay? One third. Next one is invasive carcinoma. Invasive carcinoma is often squamous cell carcinoma, okay? So squamous cell carcinoma, um, we will talk about this in details in the future, but how do they appear under biopsy? If you do a biopsy of a squamous cell carcinoma, then how do they appear? They appear like keratin pearls with intercellular bridges like this. K P, meaning keratin pearls, pearls of keratin with disorganized structures, uh, increased nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio, high amount of chromatins, the nucleus, they appear bigger than the cytoplasm, and they have intercellular bridges. For US Assembly step one, they will use these two terms a lot to describe sperm muscle carcinoma keratin pearls and intercellular bridges. If you guys want, you can write this down because in your reproductive system, if they come up with a question that is, um, you have a patient with an exophytic mass, we did a biopsy. In the biopsy, we found that there is, um, we did a biopsy and then we found that in the biopsy, we have uh, keratin pearls and intercellular bridges. If that's what they say, then what is your diagnosis? The diagnosis is squamous cell carcinoma. Have I made myself clear, yes or no? Okay. Now, if we have a lung squamous cell carcinoma, can the lung squamous cell carcinoma also have keratin pearls and intercellular bridges? Yes or no? The answer is yes. If we have a mouth or a buccal mucosa squamous cell carcinoma, do we have keratin pearls and intercellular bridges? The answer is yes. Okay. So that's that. Okay, good. Next one. POI. Very important. Okay. POI. Very important. Oh, uh, there's another thing, obviously, in, in invasive carcinoma, you can diagnose it by a colposcopy and biopsy, and uh, they can go and block the, the ureters. If they grow out a lot, then they can block your ureters that can cause hydronephrosis and renal failure. That's a complication of an advanced squamous cell carcinoma, but it's not very high yield, so that's why I did not discuss this. 
another another thing I really want to discuss with you over here, squamous cell carcinoma in early stages, is it better than adenocarcinoma? Yes or no? The answer is number one, yes. Next one, squamous cell carcinoma, can it be treated with surgery? The answer is yes. Chemotherapy and radiotherapy, which one is more um, effective for squamous cell carcinoma? The answer is the answer is, can anyone tell me which one is more effective for squamous cell carcinoma? The answer is radiotherapy, not chemotherapy. Radiotherapy is more effective for squamous cell carcinoma. Okay. Next one, primary ovarian insufficiency. Okay, so you guys might be wondering why I'm talking about squamous cell carcinoma and their treatments. The reason is because uh, step one has become pass and fail, right? And a lot of questions of step one are changing into clinical questions. So I, uh, so I have decided to share clinical information with each and every thing if I remember, so that if you guys ever come up with a clinical question, you guys can answer those clinical, que clinical questions very easily, okay? So squamous cell carcinoma treatment, radiotherapy, and surgery, okay? That's it. Next one, let's, let's move on to primary ovarian insufficiency. What is primary ovarian insufficiency? Once again, Females, do they only have a limited supply of ovum throughout their whole life? The answer is yes. Okay. Isn't there a possibility that that supply can run out before time? The answer is yes. Right. So if there is a female who has premature ovarian failure that prevents, that forgets, I mean, the premature ovarian failure that um, the ovaries, they are depleted of all the ovums. Is, will there be any future pregnancy for that patient? The answer is no there will not be any future pregnancy for, for that patient, right? So what happens is that we have premature atresia of the ovarian follicles in females of reproductive age. And this is often, this could be idiopathic. Also, if there's any female who has repeated oophoritis, will there be fibrosis of the ovaries? Yes or no? The answer is yes. If there is any female who has repeated pelvic inflammatory disease, will, can, there also be, can there also be fibrosis? of the fallopian tubes and the uterine canals? The answer is yes. If there is a female who has had exposure to trauma, surgery, radiotherapy, or chemotherapy, can it also cause primary ovarian insufficiency? Yes or no? The answer is yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay, very good. So patients, they, they present with signs of menopause after puberty, but before age. And signs of menopause are very simple to understand. Since the ovaries fail, the ovaries are responsible for the synthesis of estrogen. So estrogen will decrease and FSH and LH will be high due to absence of which feedback, positive feedback or negative feedback? Very good, due to absence of negative feedback. Now, have I made myself clear, yes or no? Okay, good. Next one. Next one is, what are some common causes of anovulation? Very important. Meaning that what are some common causes of absence of ovulation? Why do we do not get ovulation? Um, so before we talk about anovulation, does anyone know the normal physiology of ovulation? <clears throat> when do we get ovulation? Females get ovulation in, in the 12th to 14th day of a normal menstrual cycle. Yes or no? Best answer, please. The answer is yes. How? What happens? The estrogen, they start to rise. And at one point, the estrogen, they cause excessive release of LH. The estrogen, instead of becoming a negative feedback, it acts as a positive feedback in the mid-cycle. This creates an LH surge. That surge of LH results in release of more estrogen. And that estrogen causes the release of the ovum from the graphene follicle. The remaining portions of the graphene follicle, they become into which structure? They become into corpus luteum, yes or no? So this is the normal physiology. Now, always remember this, <clears throat> normal physiology is something that we get in when the body is functioning normally, yes or no? If there is any underlying pathology in the body, do we have disruption of our normal physiology, yes or no? The answer is yes. The number one reason why females can suffer from an anovulation that we do not stress enough is stress itself, meaning stress, physiological stress, mental stress, any type of stress in the body will cause a disruption of the hypothalamus pituitary axis, right? HPO axis. What is the hypothalamus pituitary axis? You know, like how the hypothalamus, they secrete GNRH, the pituitary secretes FSH and LH, and in turn, you get estrogen and progesterone, right? 
So if there is something wrong in your body, always remember this. I'm pretty sure you guys can relate to all the female students over here. Females, do they affect from absence of menstruation if they're in any physical stress or mental stress? Yes or no? The answer is yes, right? So the menstrual cycle gets disrupted. The question is why? Because of disruption of the HPO axis. And for example, let's say that there's another female whose body is under severe stress because the female is involved in severe athletic activity every day. For example, let's say we advise females to work out 45 to one hour or one hour to one hour, 15 minutes every day. That's normal. But let's say that there's a female bodybuilder or a female athlete who's working out three hours every day for the last one year. Do they have excessive body stress? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Can that stress uh, can that stress disrupt the HPO axis? The answer is yes. Right. We call that exercise. We call that sort of stress exercise induced stress, exercise induced amenorrhea. So I'll talk about this in one second. Before I talk about this, let's just touch base on the different types of causes. Okay. So the number one cause of anovulation is stress, and then we have pregnancy. PCOS is another, it's another condition, which makes sense. If the ovaries are filled with cyst, polycystic ovaries, then they will not release ovum. Premature ovarian failure, meaning that early ovarian atresia due to, again, idiopathic reason, chemotherapeutic reason, radiotherapeutic reason, traumatic reasons, surgical reasons, we can get premature ovarian failure. Next one is hyperprolactinemia. That makes sense, right? Because if prolactin level in the body is very high, what happens to the GnRH level? Is it increased or is it decreased? The answer is it's decreased, right? So if GnRH is low, then the HPO axis is also not functioning properly. Then very high yield thyroid disorders. Which type of thyroid, which type of thyroid disorders can cause anovulation? The answer is both hypothyroid and hyperthyroid. Both of them can cause anovulation. As simple as that. Eating disorders, very important, especially which one? Anorexia nervosa anorexia nervosa okay very quickly does anyone know the difference between anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa which one has a normal bmi which one has a normal bmi anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa bulimia nervosa very good okay i'll talk about this later now another one is competitive athletes Cushing syndrome, adrenal insufficiency, chromosomal abnormalities, example term, Turner syndrome. Now, the next question is, do you have to remember all the causes of anovulation or any cause of anovulation? The answer is no. Okay. This is just for the fact that they have mentioned this so that you are well aware that anovulation is caused by number one, stress and pregnancy. Stress can be physical stress, mental stress. If there's a physical stress, this means excessive exercise, which is the physiology and pathologies are a uh, million types of pathologies can cause anovulation. PCOS, ovarian failure, carcinoma, chromosomal abnormalities, eating disorder, thyroid disorder, any type of stress can cause anovulation. Yes. Have I made myself clear? Yes or no? Okay, let's move on to this one. Okay, just give me one second. Let me just. Let's talk about functional hypothalamic amenorrhea. Functional hypothalamic amenorrhea is excessively important for your step one exam. It's also called exercise-induced amenorrhea. So what happens is females who are exercising excessively with severe dietary restriction, they lose a lot of energy. And when they lose a lot of energy, what hormone is released in, in, in um, stress? The hormone that is released in stress is cortisol. Yes or no? Cortisol is a stress hormone. <clears throat> For example, let me, let me make you understand a very basic physiology. Is everyone ready? Yes or no? Now, our body functions in such a way to keep one organ alive at all times. What is the name of that organ? The name of that organ is? Our body functions in one way to keep one organ alive at all times. The name of, the name of that organ is? Brain. Very good. Very good. The name of that organ is brain. So, do you, you know like how right now you guys are sitting on the desk and you guys are in a comfortable position? Yes or no? The answer is yes, right? So your body is under a comfortable, com comfortable position. But let's say you put yourself in an uncomfortable position. Whenever you put yourself in an uncomfortable, uncomfortable position, 
your brain does not like it, right? That's why your brain asks you to stop. For example, if you study for too long, does that put you in an uncomfortable position? Yes or no? The answer is yes. When you exercise too long, does, does that put you in an uncomfortable position? The answer is yes. So whenever you are in an uncomfortable position where your brain is functioning more, right? Whenever you're learning something new for a long period of time or you're working out or you're doing something, your brain is working more. If your brain is working more, does it need more glucose and more blood supply? The answer is yes. So in response to that stress, your body releases a hormone, specifically cortisol, that is a gluconeogenetic, gluconeogenetic hormone, meaning that cortisol will, will convert all the different types of nutrition in the body, especially carbohydrate, I mean, especially protein and fat, and they will convert them to glucose. If they convert them to glucose, now does the brain have enough glucose to survive the uncomfortable position or the uncomfortable situation? The answer is yes or no. The answer is yes. Okay. But what happens is whenever we have excessive release of cortisol, right? Excessive, excessive release of cortisol, this excessive release of the cortisol, what it does is that it also decreases your, it, it also disrupts your HPO axis, hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis. Right, so that excessive release of, of the cortisol they disrupt the HPO axis, and if you disrupt the HPO axis, do you have low FSH and LH? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Do you have low estrogen? The answer is yes. As simple as that. There's also a little bit of um, there's also a little bit of leptin that has a role to play in this. Increased amount of leptin has also shown to cause uh, HPO axis abnormalities, but if you had to choose one between leptin and, and, and cortisol, which one would you choose? The answer is cortisol. Okay. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay, good. Next one, functional hypothalamic amenorrhea. This is also associated with eating disorders and female athlete triad, very important. And the female athlete triad is basically de um, decrease, decrease uh, caloric availability or increased exercise. <clears throat> will also result in decreased bone mineral density and menstrual dysfunction. Now, let's see who can tell me why we get decreased bone mineral density in females, especially specifically if they are if they have excessive exercise, decreased estrogen. Very good. Okay, good. So, decreased amount of estrogen, low estrogen. So that. Okay, good. Next one is PCOS. Is everyone ready? Yes or no? Have to talk about PCOS. PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome. What do we mean by polycystic ovarian syndrome? Meaning that the ovaries, they're filled up with multiple cysts, as you can see in the ultrasonogram, right? So this is basically a, a condition where females, they have multiple cysts in their ovaries. Now, what are some of the risk factors? So some of the risk factors with uh, for developing PCOS are that number one, this could be idiopathic, this could be familial, this could be uh, either due to excessive weight, right? Any sort of underlying disorder, for example, hypothyroidism, anything, always remember this. If there is a female who is predisposed to have decreased BMR, basal metabolic rate, anything that decreases the female basal, metab the, that decreases the female basal metabolic rate, for example, absence of exercise, fat diet, obesity, then um, females who are exposed to oral contraceptive pills, females who have hypothyroidism, these are the sort of females that can have polycystic ovarian syndrome. So what happens is that whenever you have excessive cysts <clears throat> in the ovaries, they, they function in such a way that they decrease estrogen production and they increase your testosterone production, especially in, the, especially in females. And this excessive testosterone production and androgen production, what that does is, this causes severe insulin resistance. So if there is insulin resistance due to excessive deposition of fat, because testosterone is a lipogenic hormone, right? Testosterone will increase your muscle mass, will increase synthesis of all the hormones. So if that's the case, if we have increased amount of fat, can we have insulin resistance? Yes or no? The answer is yes, right? So can we expect females who have PCOS to develop diabetes later in their life? The answer is yes. Okay, so that's what I'm trying to say. So let's talk about this. 
So hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance are hypothesized to alter hypothalamal hormonal feedback. What, do you, what does this mean? Hyperinsulinemia and insulin, insulin resistant hypothesized. This word means that this, this word means that hyperinsulinemia is only a hypothesis of PCOS. It's not a theory. It's a hypo theory, meaning that it has not been confirmed. It's not proof. Okay. So if someone asks you, why do we get PCOS? The number one, the number one reason is idiopathic. Okay. So hyperinsulinemia and insulin, insulin resistance is a risk factor. What happens is that FSH and LH is increased. Androgens are more produced from the theca internal cells and the follicular maturation is low. If the follicular maturation is low, do we get ovulation or no ovulation? We get no ovulation. Okay. Now, females, can they have uh, menstrual abnormalities with PCOS? Yes or no? The answer is females, can, can they get menstrual abnormalities with PCOS? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay. <clears throat> so if you think about the PCOS like this, okay. For example, let's say this is the female's hypothalamus, pituitary, and these are the ovaries that are filled up with cyst. The hypothalamus is secreting the GnRH, the pituitary is secreting the FSH and LH, right? And when they go and they induce the ovaries, since the ovaries are filled up with cyst, will they release more estrogen in response to the FSH and LH? Yes or no? The answer is no. But this FSH and LH, can they come and they induce the production? For example, if we take a small amount of tissue from over here and we visualize this over here, then what do we see? Do we see theca internal cells and granulosa cells? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So what happens? LH will come to the theca internal cells and cholesterol will be converted to androstenedione. Androstenedione will move from theca interna to granulosa cell. And instead of being converted to estrogen by the enzyme aromatase, which is not functioning because the cysts are preventing the formation of estrogen, this androstenedione gets converted to androsterone, androsterone, and androsterone gets converted to androgen, and androgen gets converted to last chance piece, very good, testosterone. So can we expect the females to have problems such as acne? The answer is yes. Can we expect the females to have hirsutism? The answer is yes. Weight gain? The answer is yes. How about voice change? Do we get voice change in PCOS? Absolutely not. Do you, who remembers that I said voice change in female is only from exogenous steroid hormone, from exogenous steroid. Have I made myself clear, yes or no? Okay. <clears throat> so this is the pathophysiology of your PCOS, okay? Now, if we get insulin resistance, do we also get a condition where we have velvety plaques in the axillary folds, the gluteal folds, and everything else? The answer is yes. What is the name of this condition? Acanthosis, negligence, right? To that point. Another thing is this, that the high amount of um, testosterone and estrogen, I mean, the a high amount of androgens, my apologies, not estrogen, the high amount of androgens, can they cause growth of the uterine endometrium? The answer is yes. This puts the patient at risk of developing endometrial carcinoma, right? So that's that. Are we clear? Yes or no? Everyone? Are we clear about PCOS? I'm not sure. Dr. Sana, please unmute yourself and ask me the question directly. What was confusing to you so that I can clear your confusion? And move forward. Assalamualaikum, Dr. Hedri. Yeah, I actually uh, don't understand the entire process that you told about the theca interna and uh, the granulosa cells. Uh, what I remember from the last lecture was that uh, FSH acts on the granulosa cells and uh, uh, on the theca lutea cells, LH acts, and then there's some internal migration of endosteen deon. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, that's exactly what's that's... happening. Okay. Like, okay. So what you have described is the normal physiology. So you understood yes. what you have just said. Take our internal cells and the cells, LH, LH and FSA, they, they form the endosthenic beyond. Yes or no? Did you understand? Uh, like up to here? Yes. 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 Okay. Now the thing is, are we talking about a patient who has normal physiology, or are we talking about a patient who has a pathology? A, a pathology. Okay, very good. So we're talking about the patient who has a pathology. What is the pathology? The pathology is that in the ovaries there are um, there are multiple cysts. Yes or no? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay. So due to the presence of this cyst, can the cells produce estrogen properly under the influence of FSH and LH? Yes or no? The answer is no. No. The answer is no. Very good. So if they cannot produce estrogen, what is going to happen to all the androgenic beyond that is being formed due to the FSH and LH? Instead of forming into estrogen, androsteny can can they convert to androgens? Yes or no? The answer All is right. yes. Okay, yeah. yes. Okay, so that's exactly what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Instead of forming into estrogen, since they cannot form, because over here there's a problem, because the ovaries are filled up with cysts, that's why the androsteny they will convert to androgens. The androgens will form into testosterone. Testosterone will convert to dihydroxytestosterone and cause acne, hirsutism, weight gain. Okay. And the reason we have more LHN and FSH is because we have low estrogen mm, levels. Low right? estrogen levels, yes. Yes, thank you. Okay, okay. Now, there's another thing I want to bring to everyone's attention. Estrogen level dec- is decreased throughout the whole ovulatory cycle, but in PCOS, sometimes you can get a sudden surge of estrogen, right? For example, let's say that this cyst could be fun- non-functional or functional cyst. So, e- so even though we said we say that estrogen level is very low in PCOS, in, there are, in some cases, for example, females with PCOS, do they also go to do, do they also go through monthly LH surge? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Females who have PCOS, they also go through monthly LH surge. That monthly LH surge produces a transient period of time, a very short period of time when that estrogen level keeps on rising. Okay, that estrogen rise can contribute to your endometrial hyperplasia sometimes. Endometrial hyperplasia and endometrial carcinoma. Okay, so to sum it all, to sum it all, in patient of PCOS, is testosterone high or is estrogen high? The answer is testosterone is higher than estrogen. Okay, but can estrogen be also high in transient period of anovulation? The answer is yes. Okay, so that's what I'm trying to say over here. So how do we treat PCOS? That's very important. The treatment of PCOS is, first of all, do we have to advise patients to lose their weight? Yes or no? The answer is yes. If someone is hypothyroid, do we treat them with thyroid medications? Yes or no? The answer is yes. (coughs) Do we give oral contraceptive pills, which consist of estrogen and, and, and progesterone? The answer is yes. The number one treatment of PCOS is prescription of oral contraceptive pills. Oral contraceptive pills, which contains ethanol, estradiol, and medoxy, uh, methyl medoxy, progesterone, uh, my apologies, methyl progesterone, what they do is that they supply the normal amount of estrogen and progesterone, which, for example, if we supply normal amount of estrogen and progesterone to this axis, to this hypothalamopituitary axis, can this cause negative feedback to the pituitary? Yes or no? The answer is yes. And then the high FSH and LH that we usually see in a patient who is not being treated with PCOS, can they come down when we give them OCP, FSH and LH? The answer is yes. Okay. Are we clear, guys? Yes or no? Okay. So that's that. So treatment is with cycle reduction, OCP. Um, We also give clomiphene. Clomiphene is... Clomiphene is an ovulatory in, in inductor. Now, clomiphene, is this a GnRH agonist or a GnRH antagonist? Last answer, please. Clomiphene, is it a GnRH agonist or a GnRH antagonist? This is a GnRH. Very good. This is a GnRH agonist. Okay. Clomiphene is a GnRH agonist. So, you know, like that high amount of um, FSH and LH that is there at one point, can it, at one point, can it decrease the GnRH? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So we can give clomiphene from outside. You know, like the high, how the hypothalamopituitary axis is disturbed in PCOS to fix the hypothalamopituitary axis, we can give clomiphene. So that's it. 
we can give spironolactone. Spironolactone has anti-androgenic effect. Do you remember that? Spironolactone have anti-androgenic effect. Yes or no? The answer is yes. Can we give finasteride? The answer is yes. Finasteride and flutamide, these are 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. If we decrease 5-alpha reductase, do we have more dihydroxytestosterone or less dihydroxytestosterone? Press the answer, please. We have less dihydroxytestosterone. So that's that. So can we treat hirsutism? The answer is yes. Are we clear, yes or no? Okay. Oof. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, let's let's move forward. So, so did, it, did everyone understand the concepts from the last page, this page, yes or no? Yes, okay, good. Now, let's talk about primary dysmenorrhea. What is primary dysmenorrhea, right? Primary dysmenorrhea, this is an idiopathic cause of painful menstruation. When, uh, this is usually very common in females who have just started menstruating, or this could also be due to um, any other psychological issues or idiopathic issues. It's primarily idiopathic, right? But if there is only one cause that can happen, that is, if there is a female who is experiencing menstruation for the first time, can there be excessive uterine contraction in response to the blood of the endometrium? Yes or no? The answer is, the answer is yes. I'm going to tell you why. Always remember this. Is uterine a smooth muscle or a skeletal muscle? The uterus is a smooth muscle, as simple as that. So smooth muscles are very prone to be active with sympathetic and parasympathetic responses. Yes or no? The answer is yes. So whenever our body experiences a new change, do we have sympathetic response or parasympathetic response? We have a sympathetic response. Sympathetic response, does it cause smooth muscle contraction or smooth muscle, smooth muscle dilatation? The answer is smooth muscle <clears throat> contraction. So since uterus is a smooth muscle under sympathetic activity, due, which was induced by the menstruation, we can get a uterine contraction. This uterine contraction can cause decrease of blood loss and decrease blood supply, which can cause an ischemic pain. That is, this is again, a hypothesis because the majority of the reason why females experience painful menstruation from without any pathology is idiopathic. Okay, so treatment is very simple. We treat it with NSAIDs. In your step one exam, how do you diagnose primary dysmenorrhea from all the answer options? You diagnose primary dysmenorrhea from all the answer options by diagnosis of exclusion. You exclude each and every disease. Have I made myself clear? Yes or no? Okay. okay. Next one is ovarian cysts. Before we jump into ovarian cysts and ovarian carcinomas and uterine, car uterine, uterine carcinoma, do you guys want to take a 15-minute <clears throat> break? Yes or no? Okay. So let's take a break for 15 minutes, and then let's come back. We will talk about ovarian carcinomas, ovarian tumors, uterine carcinomas, breast. I'm not sure how much we can finish today. I wanted to finish the entire pathology today, but maybe that's not realistic. Give me one second. Okay. So maybe we just need two more classes to finish the reproductive system. So don't worry. Uh, let's not focus on the quantity of the study. Let's focus on the quality with which we study. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Let's take a break for 15 minutes and then let's come back. Okay, so um, I will see you guys at 12, 16 p.m. Thank you so much.
Okay, is everyone back from the break? Can you guys hear my voice? Is everyone back from their break? Can you guys hear my voice? Yes or no? Okay, good. So let's begin. No. So now we will talk a little bit about ovarian cysts and ovarian carcinomas. All in all, what I want to talk about is uh, ovarian neoplasms. Is everyone ready? Yes or no? Okay, good. So um, before we talk about the pathology, let's talk about the physiology first. So let me draw up an ovarian structure <clears throat> like this. And let's make the structure three-dimensional. I mean, two-dimensional. Okay, so whenever we have a structure like this, this is the ovaries. They have another boundary over here. Okay, then what else do they have? They have a maturing follicle. Right? with the developing ovum, right? So that's that. Now, in something like this, we have a couple of uh, ovarian structures. The number one ovarian structure is that this layer, right? This layer, this is known as the epithelium. Okay. Next, this is the egg structure. So this is the egg. And <clears throat> this portion in the middle, this is the cortex. It's a very simple diagram. So if you have any tumors that are arising over here, what sort of tumors are they, fast answers please? They are? Very good, epithelial tumors. If you have tumors that are arising from the egg, what sort of a tumor are they? They are germ cell tumor. If you have a tumor arising from the cortex, what sort of a tumor are they? The cortex is responsible for hormonal secretion. So they are stromal tumors or sex cord stromal tumors. Okay, so that's that. Now, this is the normal um, physiology or the anatomy of the ovum. So now what I wanna talk about is, before I jump into the neoplasm, I wanna talk about two cysts. We have a cyst known as follicular cyst, and we have a cyst known as Kika lutein cyst. These are benign neoplasms, more or less. Now the thing is, what is a follicular cyst? A follicular cyst is the cystic swelling of this follicle due to the fact that the follicles did not rupture. If the follicles do not rupture, can we expect the follicles to get swollen up with fluid? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So whenever we have a distension of, the, of an unruptured follicle, we have a cyst known as follicular cyst. This is the most common type of an ovarian cyst that we can find either incidentally or females can come especially females in a young age, let's say early 20s or late teen years, they will come to you at a very young age with an ovarian mass that could or could not be painful. And most of these follicular cysts are incidental finding. Next one is, if this is a benign cyst, will they be smooth? The answer is yes. Will they be mobile? The answer is yes. Will they have a lot of blood supply? The answer is no, right? As simple as that. Next one is theca lutein cyst. What is a theca lutein cyst? Always remember this, follicular cysts 
are unilateral, meaning there can only be one. And theca lutein cysts are bilateral or multiple. Based on the fact if they are unilateral or bilateral or multiple, we can diagnose them on follicular cysts and theca lutein cysts only. Have I made myself clear? Yes or no? Theca lutein cysts can also be converted to hydrity form mole. If there is a theca lutein cyst, they can convert to hydrity form mole sometimes. So have I made myself clear on the unilateral and bilateral forms of theca lutein cysts? Yes or no? If I say theca lutein cyst, is there swelling of the entire follicle or just the theca interna? The answer is that there is severe swelling of the theca interna. Okay, very good. That's it. So let's talk about the tumors very quickly. Okay. So we're done talking about the follicles uh, and the benign cyst. Okay. Now, what I want to talk about is I want to talk about the ovarian neoplasm one by one. Give me one second. Okay. So based on the structure of the ovaries, based on the structure of the ovaries, we have epithelium, we have the egg, and then we have the stroma or the cortex. Okay. One second, please. My apologies. Okay, we have the epithelium, the stroma, and the cortex. So now let's talk about the epithelium. The epithelium tumors are of two types. That is tumors that are arising from the epithelium. They are of two types. Number one, this could be benign, this could be malignant. Okay. So when I talk about epithelial tumors, if I talk about a benign tumor, the most common benign tumor. Okay, let's talk about the benign tumors first. The benign tumor of the epithelium, the most common one is known as a serous cyst adenoma. Are we clear? Yes or no? How do we diagnose serous cyst adenoma? If there is a female who comes to you on an incidental finding, if you see a swelling in the egg, is that a serous cyst adenoma or is that a follicular or a theca lutein cyst? Which one? If you see a swelling in the egg and a, a benign swelling of the egg or the follicle, that's a follicular cyst. If you see a benign swelling in the epithelial region, is that a serous cyst adenoma? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay. Now, that swelling can have a composition of either a, of a serous type or they can have a composition of a mucus type. So based on what type of the composition of the cyst is, we can either conclude that this is a serous or, mu or a mucus, or we say mucinous cyst adenoma. Now, if I have to say which one is more common, serous or mucinous, which, what, is the most what is the most probable answer? The answer is serous cyst adenoma is more common. That's it. How do we diagnose mucus, mucus or mucinous cyst adenoma on an ultrasonogram? On an ultrasonogram, can we tell if the composition is serous or mucinous? Yes or no? The answer is no. So how do we say this is a serous or mucinous on ultrasonogram? This is a clinical question once again. Mucinous adenoma will appear in the epithelial region with multi-lobules like this, lobules of mucus producing cysts. Serous will appear completely clear. Have I made myself clear? Yes or no? Okay. Okay, good. Now, if we have to talk about carcinomas in, from the epithelial region, that is malignancy, malignant. That's very simple. How do malignant carcinomas appear? Are they smooth? No. Are they mobile? No. Do they have a lot of blood supply? The answer is yes. If you see a tumor in the epithelial region that is not mobile, not smooth, has a lot of blood supply, is this, is this a potential malignant carcinoma? The answer is yes. Okay. Now, another thing is that another thing is that ovarian carcinomas, especially, they can get calcified. And when they get calcified, 
they form a body that looks like this. Can anyone name this body? This is a Samoma body. So once again, if you see a tumor in the epithelial region that is irregular, not smooth, then you have, okay, just give me one second, please. Yep. Okay. Can everyone hear my voice? Yes or no? Okay, good. So if you have a tumor that's arising from the epithelial region of the ovaries and the tumor is smooth, the tumor has, the tumor is mobile, the tumor has no blood supply, is this, ben is this benign or malignant? This is benign. If the consistency is serous and there is no multilobules, is this serous or mucinous? This is? Serious, very good. If it's multi-loculated and lobulated, is this serious or mucinous? This is mucinous, very good. <clears throat> okay, next one. That I wanna talk about is um, that from the epithelial region, we're done with most of the tumors. There's another tumor that can arise from the epithelial region. Another one is well, whenever we have a, whenever we have a, a malignant ovarian carcinoma, do we have a calcification and formation of samoma bodies? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay. Now, once again, if the malignancy is a multi-lobulated malignancy that, that is arising from the epithelial tumors, it's irregular and um, it has a mucousy consistency, what type of an adenocarcinoma is this? Is this a serous adenocarcinoma or mucinous? The answer is this is a, mu this is a mucinous adenocarcinoma. Okay. Good. There's another type of a tumor that can arise from the epithelial region. We call that tumor Brenner's tumor, Brenner. Okay. Br Brenner's tumor. Now Brenner's tumor is basically a tumor which is usually benign, it's not malignant. And the way that this tumor can be differentiated with serous, <laughs> uh, with serous adenoma and mucinous adenoma is that Brenner's tumor will always be encapsulated. Have I made myself clear? Yes or no? Okay, serous tumor will always be, I mean, the Brenner's tumor will always be encapsulated. And if you do a histopathology of this tumor, this tumor will appear pale yellow, as simple as that. This is not very commonly asked, so you, so you do not have to worry about this. But if you ever see a presence of an epithelial tumor that is encapsulated and pale yellow, the answer is Brenner's tumor, okay? So let's uh, sum up all our epithelial tumors very quickly. Do I have everyone's attention, yes or no? Yes, okay. 
So you have a tumor over here in this region. Is this an epithelial tumor, stromal tumor, or a jostle tumor? Fast answer, please. This is an epithelial tumor. Okay, if it's smooth, if it's, if it's not multi-lobulated, and if it's a benign tumor, then what type of a tumor is this? Serous. If it's smooth, if it's multi-lobulated and it's benign, what sort of a tumor is this? This is mucinous. If it's uh, not smooth, if it's irregular, and if this has calcifications and somoma bodies, and there is no multi-lobules, what sort of a carcinoma is this? This is serous cyst carcinoma. If it's uh, if if it's if it's not if it's multi-lobulated, irregular, and if it um, has uh, a high amount of blood supply and it's not mobile. What sort of a carcinoma is this? Mucinous. If this, if this is a benign tumor that is encapsulated in the epithelial region, what sort of a tumor is this? Brenner. Okay, so with that being said, we're done with all the epithelial tumor. Okay, now let's move on to germ cell tumors. So once again, let's draw the ovaries very quickly. Okay. Now, if we have a tumor that is arising from this structure over here, what sort of a tumor is this? This is a germ cell tumor. Okay. Now, germ cell tumors are again of two types, benign and malignant. Now, if it's a benign tumor, okay, if it's a benign tumor, how will they appear? The number one benign tumor of the germ cell is a teratoma. That is a mature cystic teratoma. It has to be matured and it has to be cystic because immature teratomas are malignant. So how do we know this is a mature cystic teratoma? The way that we can know this, that this is the mature cystic teratoma is over here, first and foremost, this will have all the signs and symptoms of a benign tumor. That is over here, if we have a tumor, that is encapsulated, smooth, mobile, not, uh, um, uh, does not have a lot of blood supply. And that will give us the characteristic that it's a benign tumor. And since germ cell tumor is the only place where we only have one benign tumor, whenever we see this sort of a structure in the egg, can we always make the diagnosis that this is a mature cystic teratoma? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay, so that's one. Number two is that if it's a mature cystic teratoma, especially teratomas are tumors which contains derivatives of all the three germ layers, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. Can we expect these tumors to be filled up with tissues such as teeth, hair, bones, and everything else? The answer is yes. Another thing is the endoderm is also responsible for giving rise to the thyroid. Yes or no? The answer is yes, right? So some of these patients who have metrocystic teratoma, they have thyroid tissues in the ovaries. They have thyroid tissues in the ovaries. We call this struma ovary. We call this struma ovary. Okay, as simple as that. So um, the thing is, these, these patients, can they have signs and symptoms of hyperthyroidism? But over here, in the thyroid of these patients, will we have a lot of T3, T4, and thyroid globulin? The answer is no. Why? Because the excessive amount of thyroid tissues, I mean, the thyroid hormone that is being produced by the thyroid cells in this mature cystic teratoma, can they suppress the normal TSH? Yes or no? The answer is. Okay. Just give me one second, please. Okay, so if we have a lot of thyroid hormone that is being produced by the struma ovaries, what would happen to the TSH? Will it be high or will it be low? The answer is TSH is going to be high or low. It is going to be low. Okay, so that's that. Now, so that's basically all about the benign tumor of the germ cell that is the metrocystic teratoma. So now let's talk about the malignant tumor of the germ cell. The malignant tumors of the germ cells are usually three in number. Okay, now since we talked about mature cystic teratoma, if we have another sort of a tumor that is arising from the germ cell that is irregular in shape, not capsulated, 
has a lot of blood vessels and it, it contains hair, feet, sebum. What, what, what is the name of this germ cell tumor? The name of this germ, germ cell tumor is immature teratoma. Okay, immature teratoma. That's it. So that's the number one malignant germ cell tumor. Did you understand how to diagnose this immature teratoma? Yes or no? The answer is the answer is yes. Okay. Next one is let's say that we have another sort of a tumor in the in the germ cell area. We have another sort of a tumor. This tumor once again is appearing to be rough, not capsulated, has a lot of blood supply, right? Not mobile. And this does not contain hair, feet, sebum, and all of those things. So is that an immature teratoma? Yes or no? The answer is no. But is it a malignant tumor or a benign tumor? This is a malignant tumor based on the appearance of the tumor, right? Next is, if we do a histopathology of this tumor, we find that under histopathology, this tumor has weirdly this sort of an appearance. What is this thing that I'm drawing over here? This is a fried egg. So if we see something like this in a malignant tumor in the germ cell, the diagnosis for this is this journey, no more. Have I made myself clear, yes or no? Okay. Okay. And always remember that with germ cells, especially this germinoma, right? Especially with this germinoma, you will have increased amount of HCG and LDH secretion. Okay. Have I made myself clear? Yes or no? Answer is yes or no. Have I made myself clear? Yes. Okay, good. Now, there's another sort of a tumor that's, let's say there's another sort of a tumor that is appearing in the germ cell area that is irregular, that is not, that does not have a uniform shape. It's not capsulated. It, it has a lot of blood supply. It's not mobile. Is this a benign tumor or a, or a malignant tumor in the germ cell? The answer is, this is a malignant tumor. So we take a little bit of the biopsy. In the biopsy, if we see hair uh, or uh, let's say, um, sebum teeth, then what sort of a malignant tumor is this? This is an immature teratoma, very good. If we see um, fried egg appearance, what sort of a tumor is this? This is a dysgerminoma, very good. Now, let's say that we take a little bit of the tissue and we do a biopsy and in, under the biopsy, we see bodies that look like this. We see bodies that looks like this. Let's say this is the histopathology slide. In the histopathology slide, you have a structure that looks like this. Now, does this structure look like a glomeruli? I don't know. These bodies that looks like the glomeruli, these are known as Schiller Duval bodies. Schiller Duval bodies. Schiller Duval, uh, your Schiller Duval bodies, right? They are a direct indication that this is a very good yolk sac tumor. Yolk sac tumor. And the yolk sac tumor, they can appear in two regions. Not only will they appear in the ovaries, there's also a possibility that yolk sac tumors can also appear and also appear in the sacrococcygeal region of a child. Have I made myself clear? Yes or no? Now, if it's a yolk sac tumor, can we expect the alpha fetoprotein of this tumor to be very high? Yes or no? Very good. <clears throat> Next one. 
Next one that I want to talk about. So are we done with epithelial tumors? Are we done with germ cell tumors? Yes or no? Answer is yes. Okay, now let's talk about another, another tumor. Okay. What is the name of the tumor that is arising from the cortex? Name is stromal tumors. Now, stromal tumors, if you ever see a tumor in the stromal area that is smooth, encapsulated, um, that has no blood supply, it's not invasive, is this benign or malignant? This is benign. If you see another tumor that is irregular, not smooth, has a lot of blood supply, Invasive. Is this benign or malignant? Malignant. Okay. Now let's talk about the benign tumor. Let's say on an ultrasonogram you find this sort of a tumor, right? Especially, and then you see that the site is from the stromal area. So that you diagnose it as a benign stromal tumor. So now, if it's a benign stromal tumor, what are some of the things that you will see? First and foremost, there are three types of benign stromal tumors, right? The number one type of benign stromal tumor is a Trichoma. You know, like how the stroma has two types of cells, the thica cells and the granulosa cells, thica internal cells and the granulosa cells, right? If we have swelling of one of the thica cells, can it be a trichoma? The answer is, the answer is yes. If there is a trichoma, can we have excessive production of androstenedion and estrogen? The answer is yes. So estrogen, estrogen might be very high. So if you ever see a B9 tumor and you think it's a trichoma, if you do an estrogen level and you see it's very high, can you conclude your diagnosis that this is a trichoma? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay. Next one. Next one is that uh, if you see there's another tumor that looks like this, B9, and you do a histology, and under histology, you see, um, you see cells that are yellow-brown in, in, in color. And Along with this yellow, brown, and color cells, you see excessive virilization, meaning that let's say females are start to develop acne, hirsutism, and you know, even voice change, clitoral enlargement, pattern block, male, male pattern baldness. Is there a possibility that this tumor is a sertoli lytic cell tumor? Yes or no? The answer is yes, sertoli lytic cell tumor. But the interesting part is uh, females, do they have a lot of sertoli lytic cell tumor action? Yes or no? The answer is no, right? So, the, so these sertoli lytic cell tumors are more common in males. But if you see that there is a tumor and that this tumor is androgenic, then this can be a sertoli lytic cell tumor. The third type of tumor, that's a benign tumor. You take a little bit of the tissue and inside the tissue, you find something like this. You find cells that are arranged like this. These are known as spindle cells, right? And along with this, the patients, they complain that they have, they feel like something is pulling their adnexia. So if something is pulling their adnexia, this tumor that I'm talking about right now, number three, they have fibrous structures that are pulling the tumor constantly, producing a tension. Along with this, females can also complain of ascites and pleural effusion for this tumor. This tumor is known as a fibroma, a uterine fibroma. Now the thing, I mean, an ovarian fibroma. Now the thing is an ovarian fibroma usually presents itself in a triad. The triad is that you get ovarian fibroma and with ovarian fibroma, patients also get pleural effusion and they get ascites. This is known as MIGS syndrome, okay, MIGS syndrome. So this is usually associated with the ovarian fibroma. Have I made myself clear, yes or no? Okay, good. Next one is, um, so we talked about the malignant tumors, I mean the benign tumors. Let's say that we have another tumor that looks very irregular, something like this and uh, it's not capsulated, it's invasive, and uh, it has a lot of blood supply. Is this benign or malignant? That's the answer to this. This is, this is benign or malignant? This is malignant. <clears throat> so the only malignant cell that we get 
the only malignant cell that we get in the stromal area, this malignant cell is known as a granulosa cell tumor. Granulosa cell tumor. So granulosa cell tumor is basically malignant transformation of the granulosa cell. Pica cells can only transform into benign tumors. The granulosa cells, if they transform, they can form malignant tumors. So since it's a granulosa cell, will there be excessive production of estrogen? Yes or no? Fast answers, please. The answer is yes. So females, they will have high estrogen level. Along with this, can they have uh, endometrial hyperplasia and endometrial car carcinomas for this high amount of estrogen? The answer is yes. And when you do a biopsy, what, what do we find of, inside a granulosa cell? When we do a biopsy inside of a granulosa cell, we find a cell that looks like this. Okay, we find a cell that looks like this. Okay, so this is basically the cell and the insides of this cell are haphazard, haphazard arrangement of the cell. And surrounding this cell is a blue fluid. This is called eosinophilic fluid. The name of this body that is haphazard cells emerged in a eosinophilic fluid. This is known as Paul Exner body. Yes, very good. Call granny. Call granny for granulosa and call for colicness body. Have I made myself clear? Yes or no? Okay. Now, if you have been putting attention, then now is the time to help me out. Okay. Very quickly, let's answer some questions. So quick questions, quick answers. Is everyone ready? Yes or no? Ovarian tumors. Is everyone ready? Yes or no? Ovarian tumors. Okay. Good. Number one, if we have a tumor arising from the epithelial region, right? And that tumor is smooth, encapsulated, no blood supply. Benign or malignant? Benign. If, what is the most common type of benign epithelial tumor? Serous. If, if it has multi-lobules, is this benign or malignant? If, if there, is this serous or mucinous? Mucinous. If the same type of tumor is now looking like this, irregular, excessive blood supply, not capsulated, is this benign or malignant? Malignant. If the tumor has uh, samoma bodies along with this sort of a structure, is this serous or mucinous? Serous, very good. If it has multi-lobules, then is it no samoma, no samoma body? This is mucinous. If there is another tumor that is benign that looks like this and it's yellow brown in color, then what is the name of this tumor? This is known as Brenner's tumor, very good. Let's talk about the germ cell tumor. Okay. Now the germ cell tumors are tumors that will arise from the egg, right? If you see one tumor over here in the egg and this tumor, you take a little bit of the tissue and you see that it contains, it is smooth, uni, uni, unilocular, <clears throat> does not have a blood supply. The nuclear to chromatin ratio is normal. There is no excessive clumps of, of, of chromatin, right? And uh, along with this, you see hair, sebum, teeth. Well, what is your diagnosis? Mature teratoma. Similar presentation, but let's say that the tumor appears irregular. What is your diagnosis? This is immature teratoma. And where do we get struma ovary? Mature teratoma or immature teratoma? We get this in mature teratoma. Very good. Okay. If you take a little bit of the tissue of this sort of a tumor from the egg and you see fried egg cells, what is your diagnosis? This germinoma. If you take a little bit of the tissue from this type of a tumor, arising from the egg and you see um, and you see structures that resemble glomeruli. What sort of a tumor is this? This is a yolk sac tumor, very good. Next one is, <clears throat> this is a yolk sac tumor, okay. If you have a tumor that is arising from the cortex like this, right? The tumor appears benign because of its structure and it produces estrogen. What sort of a tumor is this? This is a tachoma, very good. If the tumor is producing excessive testosterone and it has benign features, what sort of a tumor is this? Serotonin, lady cell tumor. If the tumor is surrounded by fibrous tissue and the females are also complaining of a pulling sensation in the groin, the tumor appears to be benign. What sort of a tumor is this? Fibroma, very good. 
if the tumor arising from the stromal cell is irregular like this, right? If it's irregular and uh, you see there's excessive estrogenic um, production and the females, they have a sort of body that appears of haphazard cells in a eosinophilic fluid immersion. This is a granulosa cell tumor. What is the name of the body that we see in granulosa cell tumor? The name of the body is call extra body. So with that being said, we are done with ovarian carcinomas. Okay. Now, do you realize why I have used my blank page and not the first aid? Because the because isn't there a possibility that when you read the first aid text with ovarian carcinomas, you can get overwhelmed? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay. So you could to prevent overwhelmness, I have talked about this in the blank page. Now, when you read this, is there a certain way that you can address the tumors, yes or no? Have I made myself clear? No. So let me just underline the high yield points from over here. Ovarian tumors, they're most common in nexal tumors about 55 years of age. Risk increases with age, infertility, endometriosis, PCOS, but specifically one important risk factor is BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene, okay? And also Lynch syndrome. That is the syndrome associated with MSH1 and MSH2. I'll talk about this in uh, genetics. Lynch syndrome is also another name for hereditary, hereditary non-polyposis colon. The risk of ovarian tumor decreases with previous pregnancy, breastfeeding, OCP. Epithelial tumors are typically more serious. That's that. I've talked about this. We monitor the therapy. Always remember, do we use CA125 to diagnose tumor or for prognosis of tumor? The answer is we use this for prognosis. That is treatment. That's that. Okay. So that's basically all you need to know from over here. From over here, which ones are the most important tumors? Serous adenoma, Brenner tumor. Then from over here, mature teratoma, very important. Dysgerminoma, very important. Fibroma is important. Granulosa cell, not important. Are we clear, guys? Yes or no? Yes? Okay, good. Okay. So just uh, let's take a break for two minutes and then let's begin uterine conditions. Are we clear? Yes or no? Let's take a break for two minutes and then let's begin your time condition. Thank you so much.
Okay, is everyone ready? Yes or no? Okay, can I get the help of uh, one physician who can name the ovarian pathologies, the ovarian tumors very quickly? I will only ask them questions. All they have to do is answer the questions. That's all. Please write me in the chat box very quickly. One more time. Anyone who can help me out, please. Please write me in the chat box. All you have to do is tell me the names of the tumors, the ovarian tumors. I'll describe the tumors. Dr. Otero, thank you so much. Please unmute yourself. Hello, Dr. Kiss. Yes. If you have a tumor in the epithelial region with a benign appearance, Without any lobules, no lobules. What is the most? What is the name of the tumor? It will be no lobules. It's serious. Yes. Serious. Very good. If it has lobules, then mucinous. If it looks like a malignant tumor with some of my bodies, what sort of a tumor is this? It will be um, mucinous cystadenoma. No, this is serous cystadenoma carcinoma. And serous okay. carcinoma. Sorry. Yes. Okay, no problem. Let's talk about the junk cell tumors. If I talk about a tumor which has a benign appearing tumor in the egg and it has hair, teeth, sebum, what is your diagnosis? Immature. Teratoma. If it has hair, teeth, sebum, and malignant appearance, what is your diagnosis? Immature teratoma. Very good. If it has a fried egg cell appearance, what is your diagnosis? Teeth germinoma. Very good. If it has a cell that, that looks like uh, glomerulized, what is your diagnosis? It will be Joe's heart tumor. Yolk sac tumor. Very good. If there is a tumor that is arising from the cortex, what do we call them stromal tumors? Yes or no? Uh, yes. Okay, if it's a benign appearing tumor which produces estrogen, what's the, what, what is the name of the tumor? It's a tichoma. Very good. If it's another sort of a tumor that is malignant appearing but, but produces estrogen, what is the name of the tumor? It's a granulosa. Very good. If it's a benign appearing tumor that produces testosterone, what is the name of the tumor? It will be Sertoli. Lady, right. lady. If it's a benign appearing tumor that has a pulling sensation in the tumor, what is the name of the tumor? Zephyroma. There you go. Okay. Is everyone clear? Yes or no? Is everyone clear? No. no. So do you guys want to start uterine conditions today or do you guys want to start uterine conditions tomorrow? Which one? Today? Okay. Can I get some feedback from the students today or tomorrow? Can I get some feedback from the rest of the students? Okay. <clears throat> we can talk about this tomorrow, but let me just ask you a couple of questions. It's so easy that we can finish this in five minutes. Is everyone ready? Yes or no? Okay, it's so easy that we can finish this in five minutes. Uterine conditions are two types, benign and malignant, as simple as that. Okay, let me just get a new page. Give me one second. You don't even have to read first stage, just hear my voice and the lecture, and it should be, it should be enough. Okay. So uterine conditions are two types. So either it's a benign or if it's a malignant. Let's talk about the benign one. If you have a patient who comes to you with excessive bleeding, the patient has uh, the, the breathing, the menstruation, it's not as painful, right? It, it may be painful or not painful, but there is menorrhagia with or without dysmenorrhea. And the uterus is uniformly enlarged and globular in appearance. What is your diagnosis? Uniformly globular, not irregularly globular. Uniform globularity. This is? Adenomyosis. What is adenomyosis? Is adenomyosis a condition where endometrial tissues are present in the myometrium? Yes or no? <clears throat> the answer is yes. Okay. okay, let's talk about the next one. Let's say you have another sort of a <coughs> you have another sort of a patient who comes to you. You have another sort of a patient who comes to you with excessive bleeding. And ex this excessive bleeding is characterized with a small uterus. This excessive bleeding is characterized with a small uterus. The patient also has excessive abdominal pain and you see ovarian enlargement, swelling of the ovaries. What is your diagnosis? 
This is ovarian swelling and menorrhagia. What is your diagnosis? Okay. Very quickly, if I ask you something, if the endometrial tissues, instead of being present in the uterus, if they are present in the ovaries, okay? If the endometrial tissues, instead of being in the uterus, if they're present in the ovaries, every month, will those endometrial tissues in the ovaries bleed, yes or no? The answer is yes. If they bleed and when the blood cannot escape, can the blood accumulate in the ovaries and break down to form heme and a chocolate color, yes or no? This is known as what cyst? Can anyone tell me? This cyst of the ovary is known as a? This cyst of the ovary is known as a what cyst? Chocolate cyst. Okay. And the uterus, will they appear uniformly enlarged, globular, yes or no? The answer is no. They, can we expect the uterus to be uh, normal sized or small? The answer is yes. So what is your diagnosis? This is endometriosis. Okay, next one. Next one is if we have another patient who comes to you who is postmenopausal, now comes to you with, with bleeding. If there's a postmenopausal woman who comes to you with bleeding and you do an ultrasonogram and you see that the uterine thickness, the endometrial thickness is more than 11 millimeters, what is your diagnosis? This is not carcinoma. This is hyperplasia. Is this due to excessive estrogen? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay. Let's say you have another patient who has menstrual bleeding, excessive menstrual bleeding, pain, fever, and along with menstrual bleeding, there's discharge of pus from the uterus. What is your diagnosis? This is endometritis. Have I, made, have I made myself clear? Is there a possibility that there could be foreign bodies that is present in the reproductive organ? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Especially who are the patient population that can have this? this these are the population of patients who uses intrauterine devices, who uses, um, for example, who uses vaginal tampons, and also, young children, especially female children who are very young, can they be curious enough to insert foreign objects into their reproductive organs? Yes or no? The answer is yes, especially tissues. Okay, so babies, they have a, ten they have a tendency of putting stuff in different regions, right? So let let's say that tissue has been there for a long period of time, that can cause infection. Uh, have I made myself clear? Yes or no? Pessary will cause endometritis? No, pessary will not cause endometritis. Okay. How do we treat endometritis? Do we, we usually treat endometritis since it's a lower uterine infection and it's also associated with anaerobic organism. We treat it with gentamicin and clindamycin. Okay. Good. There's another thing that I want to talk to you guys about. If there is a female who has had more than one, who has had more than one DNC, dilatation and curatage, more than one dilatation and curatage, is there a possibility that there could be fibrosis and synechiae formation inside the uterus? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Can this lead to infertility, abnormal bleeding, excessive bleeding, or no bleeding? Yes or no? The answer is yes. What is the name of the syndrome? Asherman syndrome. Okay. So with that being said, we're done with all the benign conditions. Okay. Now, next one is let's talk about the malignant conditions. When we say malignant condition, once again, there's another structure that I want to uh, put in B9 condition. The, another structure that I want to put on is, how about another, another patient who comes to you with excessive uterine bleeding and uh, the bleeding is with or without dysmenorrhea, the uterus appears irregularly enlarged, irregularly enlarged uterus. What is the name of this condition? This is fibroid or uterine leomyoma. Leomyoma. Okay. So that's it. Next one is that whenever we do a biopsy of the uterine leomyoma, 
we see cells that appears like this, arranged in a world pattern. Do you remember? I talked about meningioma in the brain that is more common in females. Meningiomas also have this world pattern of smooth muscle appearance, yes or no? These are not somoma bodies. These are smooth muscle cells arranged in a world pattern. If calcium containing tissues were arranged in a and we're arranged in a world pattern, we would call them somoma bodies. But this is not somoma, somoma bodies. This is the histological appearance of the uh, fibroid. Okay, so that, that's that. So are we clear about the benign conditions of the uterus, yes or no? The answer is yes, okay. Did we understand the benign conditions of the uterus, yes or no? Okay, good. Now let's talk about another sort of a condition. This is the malignant conditions of the uterus. What is the number one malignant condition of the uterus? Endometrial carcinoma. Yes or no? Endometrial cancer is when we have excessive proliferation. I mean, abnormal and in abnormal and excessive proliferation of the endometrium of the endometrial tissues, right? Why do we have abnormal proliferation of the endometrial tissues and the glands? This could be as a sequelae of endometrial hyperplasia due to increased amount of estrogen for a long period of time, or this could also be due to, due to loss of two genes, loss of P10, this is a tumor suppressor gene, and loss of P10, and another gene is known as MMR, mismatch repair gene. If there is a female who has a genetic predisposition to have P10 and decrease MMR, they can develop endometrial cancer. And females in general can develop endometrial cancer if they have excessive estrogen activity in the uterus, right? So that's that. Now, the thing is, the thing is endometrial carcinomas are basically of two types. Endometrial, endometrial carcinomas are endometroid, endometroid, or they are serous. Which one is more aggressive? The answer is serous type is more aggressive. Now, how do we diagnose serous type of endometrial carcinoma? We can diagnose serous type of endometrial carcinoma because in serous type of endometrial carcinomas, we have calcium cells arranged in a world pattern. We have somoma bodies. What type of ovarian carcinoma, or what type of ovarian neoplasm had somoma body? Ovarian carcinoma had somoma body? Serous cystadenal carcinoma. What type of uterine carcinoma has somoma body? Serous. Same? Yes or no? Yes. Is this the same or not? Same. Very good. Okay. And the endometroid one, the endometroid carcinoma is more associated with increased estrogen. Okay. Are we clear? Yes or no? Yes. Very good. There's another type of a carcinoma that we call that carcinoma as a leomyosarcoma. Leomyosarcoma is nothing but malignant transformation of a benign fibroid. If a benign fibroid transforms into a malignant fibroid, then we call that leomyosarcoma. How do we diagnose leomyosarcoma? These are tissues that are present in the uterine cells, right? And these are smooth muscle tissues that have malignant, that have malignant proliferation. And um, leomyosarcomas, they will have excessive pressure effect. For example, can they cause constipation? The answer is yes. Will they cause urinary retention? The answer is yes. Will they cause pelvic organ prolapse? The answer is yes. Okay, so that's it. And if we are not sure if a fibroid is benign or malignant, when we do a histology, if we see signs symptoms of malignancy of a fibroid, for example, increased nuclear to chromatin ratio, nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio, increased amount of chromatin, the cells are very uh, increased in size, right? Can we diagnose that tumor as a malignant tumor? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Are we clear, guys? Yes or no? So quick questions and quick answers. Uh, can anyone help me with active participation, please? Can Dr. Otero help me out once. Who else is here? Who else can help me out? Fast answers, please. After Otero, after Dr. Otero. Dr. Hagar, thank you so much. Please unmute yourself. Yes, hello, Dr. Yes, hi. If you have a patient who comes to you with menorrhagia and uniformly enlarged uterus, what is your diagnosis? Uh, adenomyosis. 
If you have a patient who comes to you with abdominal pain, swelling of the ovaries, menorrhagia, and normal size uterus, what is your diagnosis? And normal size uterus. What is the diagnosis? Mm. Normal size uterus, ovarian cyst. Uh, okay, endometriosis. Endometriosis, okay. If you have another patient who comes to you with fever, pain, swelling, menorrhagia, and pus discharge from the uterus, what is your diagnosis? Endometriitis. Endometriitis, very good. If you have another patient who comes to you with pelvic pain, abnormal uterine bleeding, and you see a lot of fibrosis and sinusitis, and the patient has previous history of DNC, what is your diagnosis? Ashtermans. Okay. If you have another patient who comes to your clinic, the patient has uh, uterine bleeding, and under ultrason ultrasonogram, you see thickening of the endometrium. The patient has high estrogenic problems. The patient is overweight. The patient has late menstruation, I mean, early onset of menstruation, late menopause, nulliparity. The patient takes OCP. What is your diagnosis of this patient? Uh, endometrial hyperplasia. Very good. endometrial hyperplasia. If you have another patient who comes to you with menorrhagia, dysmenorrhea, and irregularly enlarged uterus, what is your diagnosis? Leomyoma or fibroids. Very good. If you see that, the, if you take a histology of the fibroid and you see malignant features of the leomyoma, what is your diagnosis? Uh, leomyosarcoma. Very good. If there's another patient who comes to you, postmenopausal female with bleeding, and you see that there's excessive thickness and irregular growth in the uterus, what is your diagnosis? Uh, endometrial carcinoma. Okay, if the histology shows some of my bodies, what sort of an endometrial carcinoma is this? Endometrial or serous? Serous. Serous, sorry. Yes. Okay, good. Is everyone clear? Yes or no? So I want to keep the first aid lecture up with you for today. Tomorrow we will finish the reproductive pathology and hopefully also finish reproductive pharmacology. Okay. I have a request. Please unmute yourself and tell me what request you have. Uh, hello, good morning. Good morning. Uh, oh, sorry. Actually, uh, I want to join to afternoon class. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, first, I have to figure it out that is it fit with my schedule or not. Can you please send me the today's link to check it okay. out? Okay, the link for the afternoon class will always be available on our page. All you have to do is go to our page and you can see the afternoon class availability. This, this was for yesterday, uh, the one for today, I'll post it in the group, okay? Okay, good, thank you. Thank you. Next question is by Dr. Sana. Please unmute yourself and ask me the question. Uh, Dr. Hedri, yes. here it is written AUB. What does AUB, AUB stands, stands for? Abnormal uterine bleeding. Okay, thank you. Abnormal uterine bleeding. This could be excessive bleeding or no bleeding. Anything deviation from the normal is abnormal. Any other questions? Is there any other question? Yes or no? The treatment of endometritis is also with ampicillin. Ampicillin is with or without. Sometimes if we need ampicillin, we give ampicillin. If we do not need ampicillin, we do not give ampicillin. Okay? That's why we say gentamicin plus clindamycin plus minus ampicillin whenever it's needed. Okay. Any other question? Yeah. Just because you're saying thank you doesn't mean the, the class is over. This just means that the question answer section is over. We have to do questions. Do not say thank you and leave the class. Okay? Class is not over. Oh, oh you're saying thank you because you guys are happy. Good. I'm also happy that you guys have included your learning and anything else. So very good. No more questions. Okay. Let's see who are in favor of questions and who are not in favor of questions. Who are in favor of questions and who are not in favor of questions? 
And questions or no questions, fast answers, please. Fast answers, please. Questions or no questions? Questions. Questions. Now, oh, let's begin. Okay, but when I start doing the questions, mid question, a lot of students, they leave the class. So we have, we have 11 students. Um, please make sure that you complete the questions. Do not leave the class until the now unless we're done. <coughs> have I made myself clear? Yes or no? Is everyone interested in doing questions today? Yes or no? No. So please make sure that you do not leave. Make sure that you complete the questions. Okay. How much time will you get for each question? Fast answers. Ninety seconds. Okay, very good. So will I be unmuting myself? Uh, will I be muting myself? The answer is yes. Will I change the question after each and every 90 seconds? The answer is yes. If you cannot see the question, can you ask me to move up or move down? The answer is yes. Okay. Right. So best of luck. Let's do 10 questions from today and let's see how we do.
Okay, your time is up. <clears throat> Can you guys hear my voice, yes or no? Okay, your time is up. Can everyone hear my voice? No. no. Are we ready, yes or no? First physician, Dr. Tasneem, please unmute yourself. Help me read the question. <clears throat> read the last line of the question, please. Um, in the process of embryogenic development, this nodule forms as a result of the activity of which of the following? Okay. Then? An otherwise healthy eight-year-old boy is brought to the emergency department by his mother two hours after the sudden onset of scrotal pain. Okay. Physical examination shows on tender testis a tender five millimeter bluish nodule at the superior pole of the left testis. Okay. The patient undergoes urgent surgical exploration of the scrotum during okay. operation, the nodule on the superior pole of the testis is found to be necrotic. Okay, simple, very nice and simple. Now, everyone in the chat box, which one, which of the following answer options did you guys choose? Fast answers, please. Okay. Now, let me tell you something very quickly over here. If this is a leading cell, right, shouldn't the patient have excessive testosterone production? Yes or no? The answer is yes. yes. Is there excessive testosterone production in this patient? The answer is no. no. If this was excessive, uh, if this was uh, some sort of uh, estrogen producing tumor, shouldn't we have had excessive amount of estrogen? Yes or no? Yes. This results form as a result of activity of which of the following. So estrogen forming tumor, this is not estrogen forming tumor. If it was 5-alpha reductase, excessive activity of 5-alpha reductase, shouldn't there be excessive dihydroxytestosterone? Yes or no? The answer is yes. If it was excessive dihydroxytestosterone, shouldn't we have seen precautious puberty in this patient? The answer is yes. yes. Okay, so there's no precautious puberty in this patient. Now, the thing is luteinizing hormone. Once again, if there's a high amount of luteinizing hormone, once again, luteinizing hormone will increase your testosterone. If testosterone is very high, then once again, we would have seen precautious puberty. So luteinizing hormone is not the correct answer. Now, if this is a sertoli cell tumor, then sertoli cell tumor will produce excessive amount of MIF. If they produce excessive amount of MIF, mullein inhibiting factor, then what happens? Then we have inhibition of the paramesonephric duct. duct. Exactly. If we have inhibition of the paramesonephric duct, do we have formation of the remnant of the paramesonephric duct, yes or no, known as appendix yes, testis, correct. appendix testis, yes. which is usually in the superior pole. So this is a necrosis of the appendix testis, the superior pole. So over here, E is the correct answer. Have I made myself clear, everyone, yes or no? Okay. Dr. Dasneen, please be kind enough to read the next question. Okay. Um, without treatment, this patient is at greater risk for which of the following? Okay. Uh, Twenty-eight year old woman comes to the physician because she has not had a menstrual period for three months. Menarche okay. occurred at the age of twelve years. Menses occurred at regular thirty day interval until they became irregular one year ago. She okay. is one sixty centimeter in height um, to weight 85 kilogram bmi is 33.2 kilogram okay. per meter square and physical examination shows nodules and pustules along the jawline dark hair growth around the umbilicus pelvic mm. examination shows normal sized retroverted uterus mm -hmm. okay now very quickly this is an obese female who has a lot of fat 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 contains which enzyme? Fat contains aromatase. If, yep. if, this, if there's aromatase, will there be a lot of estrogen? Yes or yeah, no? Estrogen. In this female? The answer is yes. So as you can see, this patient has a lot of androgenic activity, acne, dark hair growth, and everything else. So all of this excessive androgen will cause primarily which tumor? A, B, C, D, E. Endometrium. Very good. Thank you so much. Now, okay, so thank you so much, Dr. Dasim, for helping us out. Next student is Dr. Ethar. Help me out, please, Dr. Ethar. Read the last line. Um, with, um, which of the following drug is most likely exacerbating this patient's symptom? Okay. Okay. Fifty-eight-year-old uh, woman comes to the physician with evaluation of uh, vaginal dryness and pain during sexual intercourse. Okay. Four months ago, she was diagnosed with aesthetic breast cancer, for which she is currently receiving pharmacotherapy. Mm -hmm. She smoked uh, one pack of cigarettes daily for, for fifteen years, but quit 
uh, when she was diagnosed. Physical okay. examination of thinning of vagina mucosa. Uh, DEXA scan shows a T score of 2.6 minus. Osteoporosis, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, six, now, months. six months ago, our T score was minus 1.6. It's now worse than minus 1.6, it's minus 2.6. So, meaning that she has severe osteoporosis. Okay. So, now see, she most probably is taking a medication for this. And now, for this medication, which of the following drugs is exacerbating her symptom? Now, she came with vaginal dryness and pain during sexual intercourse. If she was taking estrogen, would, would she have? Vaginal dryness, Dr. Ida, yeah. yes or no? no? Would she have pain during sexual intercourse, dyspnea, yes or no? The answer no. is no. So do you think estrogen, estrogen containing pharmacotherapy is the correct answer for this? Uh, no. The answer is no, okay. What is the problem? High estrogen or low estrogen? In uh, this, no. in this estrogen. low estrogen, very good, low estrogen. Okay, so she is taking something. Okay, let's see what she's taking. Raloxifene, what is raloxifene? Raloxifene is basically a drug which is selective estrogen receptor modulator. It's an estrogen agonist. Is she taking raloxifene, yes or no? No. The answer is no, okay. Now, Pablo, uh, Pablo C. Siquib. I, I, have no, I have no clue what this drug is. <laughs> okay, I've never heard about this drug. Pablo Siquib. This could be a chemotherapy. This could be a chemotherapeutic drug, but I know for 100%, this is not an estrogen containing drug. Okay, so I'm not going to use this. Paclitaxel is, uh, however, a chemotherapeutic drug that is used for packing of the cells. Patients mm -hmm. usually have severe peripheral neuropathy. Over here, this, does this patient have neuropathy? The answer is no. no. Crastuzumab. Crastuzumab is an estrogen containing pill. It's a monoclonal okay. antibody that works on the HER2 receptors, right? Mm -hmm. And if that's the thing, then they're also responsible for increasing amount of estrogen. Is trastuzumab the correct choice? Yes or no? No. The answer is no. Next one is stemoxifene, also a selective estrogen receptor modulator. It's an estrogen receptor agonist. It, it, this will cause excessive estrogen. Is stemoxifene the correct answer? The answer is no. That leaves us with exemestin. We'll talk after tomorrow. This is an aromatase inhibitor. If you inhibit aromatase, do we have more estrogen or less, less estrogen? That's the answer, please. Less estrogen. Less estrogen. Very good. So over here, does exomastin go with the patient presentation? Yes. Absolutely, yes. Okay, thank you so much. This was a very difficult question, by the way. As you can see, majority of the students chose tamoxifen. Because I'm going to tell you why. This is a knee-jerk question. Do you guys know what a knee-jerk question is? You know, like how in a knee-jerk, when we, when, we, when we give a... When we usually, um, for example, beat the patella tendon with a knee hammer, what happens? Do we have an excessive uh, jerk? Yes or no? The answer is yes, right? So this is a knee jerk question, meaning that whenever we hear something like this, the first thing that comes to our mind is, oh, it's breast cancer. Then the correct, uh, for, then the correct drug should be tamoxifen because tamoxifen is very widely used. But we should also keep in mind that tamoxifen is, um, estrogen, is an estrogen agonist. But this patient is coming to you with estrogen antagonistic activity. So we have to choose a drug that's estrogen antagonistic. Okay, that's that. Next one, number four, Dr. Ethar, please read the last two, read the last question. Yes, the urine culture obtained prior to initiating treatment is most likely to show which of the following. Okay. Uh, 59 year old man comes with urinary frequency and perineal pain for the past three days. He, had, uh, he, had, he has also had pain mystification. Sexually active with his wife, temperature 39.1, penis and scrotum appear normal. Digital rectal examination shows a swollen, tender okay. prostate. So she ha he has acute prostatitis. For acute right. prostatitis, the number one organism is what? E. coli, yes or no? E. coli. E. coli. Yes. Right. So which one of this is an e. e. coli presentation? The answer is e. e. coli is a lactose fermenting and pink colonies. They grow in McConkey agar, right? They grow in McConkey agar. What else grows in McConkey agar? You have E. Can, yes. uh, you have e. coli, Klebsiella, right? So these yes. are the organisms. So A is the correct answer. Okay, very good. Thank you so much, Dr. Ita. Next one, Dr. Otero, please be kind enough to unmute yourself and read the last slide. Hello, Dr. Yes. Uh, the, this medication will put her at risk uh, of developing which of the following conditions? Okay. A 60 years old man, uh, woman comes to a physician for a routine bone mineral density screening. She does not- Okay, let me tell you a funny story. You know like how when you just said a 65 year old man, oh no, it's not a man, it's a woman. 
<laughs> there has been so many times in my life when I read a US Assembly question and I read the question as that of a woman, but it turned out to be a man. And then by the end of the question, they would say that there is swelling of the prostate and I would be so confused. Uh, I would be like, where did the prostate come from? Because I thought it was a, it was a woman. So the reason why I'm sharing the story with you is that the sex of the patient is very, very important, man or woman, right? Very good. So 65 year old man, I mean, 65 year old woman comes to the physician for this. Okay, now you can read the next one. The next one is the okay. next line. Okay, she doesn't have, uh, have any children. Menopause was okay. at uh, 55 and okay. her mother died of breast cancer yeah. at age of 48 years. She has a okay. uh, pretension for which uh, she takes it. Rami Piro. Uh, okay. Yeah. Dual energy x ray absor absorptiometry at the femoral neck shows uh, 2.7, mm -hmm. uh, the T score. The physician okay. considered treatment with the reloxifen. I put mm -hmm. uh, A. Do you put? You put which one? A. Which one is the right answer? A. Why did you choose A? Because it's a risk of uh, thromboembolism uh, episode. The risk of thromboembolism is very high with selective estrogen receptor modulator. Yes or no? Mm -hmm. And with the smoking also. Patient okay. with the mm -hmm. Very good. Good job. Very, very good. Reloxifene will also cause endometrial hyperplasia, by the way, but pulmonary embolism is more common. Thank you so much, Dr. Otero. Does this need any other explanation, guys? Yes or no? I think this is very self-explanatory and very direct. So can I just move forward to the next question? Yes, thank you. Okay, let's move forward to the next question. Okay, number six, Dr. Rotero, whenever you're ready. Yes, uh, which of the following part of the female reproductive tract is uh, also lined by this type of epithelium? I think we talk about it. Uh, an investigator is studying the cellular gener regeneration of epithelial cells. She has obtained a tissue sample for a normal thyroid gland for histopathology examination. It shows follicles uh, lined by a single layer of cube like cubes. cells. With Which one has cubed? Cuboidal. A over. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, that's all by Dr. Otero. Next one. Dr. Singh, would you be kind enough, please, our previous student, student from our previous yes. batch? Thank yes, you so sir. much for joining the lecture. Hope you're doing well. I'm not really sure why you're not receiving the lecture links every other day. <clears throat> uh, the, the reason being is because you know, like how we have two groups of people who works. One is I work for myself. And the second one is we have, a, I have one team member who works with me. <clears throat> so uh, there is a little bit of a discrepancy in between me and him in which um, he's supposed to send it out, but then, you know, he's a little child. So from time to time, he makes a mistake. But I apologize for that. Would you be kind enough to read the last line, please? Which of the following is the most likely causal organism? Okay. A 23-year-old woman comes to the physician because of vaginal discharge for four days. Okay. Her last menstrual period was three weeks ago. Twelve okay. months ago, she was diagnosed with trichomoniasis, for which okay. she and her partner were treated with a course of an antimicrobial. Okay. She is sexually active with one male partner and they use condoms inconsistently. Okay. Her only medication is a combined OCP that she has been taking for the past four years. Okay. A gram stain of her vaginal fluid is shown. Which of the following is the most likely causal organism? Okay, so whenever you're ready. Uh, I think this looks like intracellular diplococci, so gonorrhea. Very good. You, this looks like intracellular diplococci in what type of a stain? Gram negative or gram positive? This is gram negative. Gram yes. negative. Yeah, why? Because it is, this is pink in color. Okay, so thank you so much. Yes. Correct answer. Next one, Dr. Singh. Yes. Would you be which kind of enough? Following, yes. Which of the following terms best describes the sexual development of this patient? Easy question. An 11 year old girl is brought to the physician for a physical examination prior to participating in sports. She is at the 50th percentile for height and weight. Physical mm -hmm. examination shows a normal female body habitus a slight increase in breast areolar diameter with nipple protrusion and normal appearing external genitalia with sparse straight hair on the labia majora. Okay. The physician concludes that the patient's breast and external genitalia are in the same stage of sexual development. development. Which one did you choose? I chose B, tenor stage two. Very good. Thank you so much, Dr. Singh, for helping me out and best of luck. Looks like you are having a very good preparation for your exam. I wish you all the best. <laughs> 
please keep on joining the lectures. Let me know if you need anything. Let's move forward. Yes, Dr. Okay. Let's move on to Dr. Hagar. Hey, Dr. Hagar, whenever you're ready. Yes. Uh, which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Uh, 17 years old girl is brought to the physician by her mother uh, because she has not had her menstrual period yet. Okay. At birth, uh, she had ambiguous genitalia. The mother reported that during pregnancy, she had noticed abnormal hair growth on her chin. Okay. A year ago, the girl broke uh, her distal radius after a minor trauma. She is at 95th percentile for height and 50, 50th percentile for weight. Physical examination shows not your cystic acne on the face, chest, upper back. Uh, breast development is standard stage one, and pelvic examination reveals normal pubic hair with clitor migraine. A pelvic okay. ultrasound shows ovaries with multiple okay. cysts and normal uterus. Okay, one second. Very complicated question. Okay, not an easy question. First of all, 17 yeah. year old female. Give, yes, 17 year old female. Right, it gives sense like this is osteogenesis Aromatase. imperfecta. God knows what this is. Could, could also be Marfan syndrome, could also be Ehlers Danlos syndrome, but let's break this down step by step. First and foremost, does, does this patient have signs symptoms of excessive testosterone activity, yes or no? Yes. Very good. Next one is, does this patient have signs symptoms of low estrogen? Answer is yes. Why? Because she has bone uh, yeah. fractures. Yeah. Osteop right? Osteo yes. uh, not osteoporosis. We can't say, yeah. We, we say that this it's... is weak bones, right? Weakening of yeah. the bones due to low amount of estrogen. Yeah. So low estrogen are seen not in PCOS as much. Yes. Mullerian agenesis, we see low estrogen. We do see low estrogen. But in Mullerian yeah. agenesis, we also see uh, absence of the uh, the absence of the uterus, but yes. this patient has a normal uterus, so this is not the correct answer. In congenital adrenal hyperplasia, she should have hypertension. Does she have hypertension? It's or no? no. So no, not no. Right. Coleman syndrome. She should have anosmia. Does she have yes. anosmia? No. no. Turner syndrome. She should have shielded chest, webbing of the neck, yes. streak over the height and weight will not be this. So these are yeah. ovaries with multiple cysts, but not streak yes. or small ovaries. So Turner syndrome is yes. not the correct answer. So that leaves us. With aromatase deficiency, yes. Okay. I guess the hint is from during pregnancy when her mother noticed the abnormal mm -hmm. hair was in on her chin. Yeah. This one, okay. Dr. Hagar, last one. Yeah, which of the following is the most likely cause of this patient's symptoms? Mm -hmm. A 79 year old woman uh, came to physician because of one month history of difficulty starting urination and a vague sensation Bye. of Give me one second. Give me one second. Well, because speculum examination in the lysotomy position shows pink structure at the vaginal introtus uh, that protrude from the anterior vaginal wall when, when the patient is asked. I guess this is a prolapse, so we can choose the, the cyst to see. Are you sure? See. Hi, guys. Yeah, I guess. Okay. Yeah, I guess. Hi, guys. So if this answer is true, oh. then... If this answer is true, then um, let's assume that, um, let's see. Okay, if this answer is true, then let's assume, inshallah, you will have a very good result in your 70 step one exam. Okay? Are you ready? <laughs> okay? Okay. Let me see if this is a true answer or not. Yeah. <laughs> not true. Not true. Not true. Mm, not true. Okay. Congratulations. Okay. Good job. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, everyone. Thank you so much, guys. Very good class today. I really enjoyed myself taking the classes of you guys. Really proud of you all. Keep up the good work. See you guys tomorrow at 10 a.m. You guys will receive the recording. Can I get Dr. Singh's attention very quickly? Dr. Singh? Yes. Yes. Would you be kind enough? Are you still in touch with your batch mates from the second batch? Uh, no, I'm not in touch with any of them. You're not in touch with any of them. Is it possible for you to reach out to, for example, in the Dr. Hadley Step 1 discussion group? You're there, right? In the Facebook group? Yes. 
Okay, could Sorry, you please let everyone know that everyone from the previous batches are welcome to come and join the lectures for free, no problem. So initially we had a in, in, initially we had a we had a discrepancy. So we took emboss and we wanted to make students subscribe to our lecture since we cleared the subscription. But then we changed the policies, and I thought a little bit about this, and I realized that a lot of students might need help because they are not doing the classes right now. So they should be allowed to come and join the class whenever they want. So if possible, if you reach out or in the section discussion, we'll just let them know that you are doing the classes with us right now. And they're also welcome to join the classes with you. Okay, okay doctor. Thank you so much. And that's that. Hope you guys have a very good day. I'll see you guys tomorrow at 10 a.m. Okay, bye-bye now. Dr. Sana, what questions do you have? This is maybe the first question that you... Um, there's so much of noise in the background. The first question. Yes, uh, my uh, my my wife is uh, taking a meeting. Uh, she's also taking a class. Just give me one second. Okay. Now. Yeah, uh, Doctor Hadri, the first question that you ruled out all the possibilities. Uh, can you please reiterate that because I am not. I think I am having uh, difficulty in comprehending uh, what granulosa cells produce, what Leydig cells produce. It is difficult for me to memorize that, and one also second. regarding this. Uh, you know the stop entertainment for Texas, Austin, and the other one who okay. think that they can be neutralized. Okay, so this is the first step of the first question. Mm -hmm. The problem is that you're not sure what's happening over here. <laughs> the question suggests that in which of the following embryological development is responsible for the for the for the chief complaints. The chief complaints of the physician of the patient is that they have a sudden onset of a scrotal pain, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Now the thing is, they described the scrotal pain, and then they did an ultrasonogram, and they found a bluish uh, nodule on the upper pole of the testis, right? Now yeah. the thing is, the upper pole of the testis. They said which of the following increased activity resulted in this org in this uh, tissue? Okay. Yeah. That's the question. Now they have a leading cell as an answer option. Now, leading cells, we know they produce more testosterone, right? Okay. So this patient, if, they, if it, there were more testosterone, then shouldn't the patient have had signs and symptoms of testosterone, such as yeah, like puberty? acne, and, yeah. acne and stuff, right? Okay, so that's yes. not there. So, so leading cell is not the answer. Mm. Next is uh, Easter Dior. If it was Easter Dior, then shouldn't the patient have had gynecomastia, palmer, uh, palmer erythema, yeah. spider? Okay, so yes. Easter Dior is not. Mm. Then the next one is leading. Uh, then the next one is... Wait, just give me one second. Five Next one was the DIT. Uh, right, five alpha reductase. If it was five mm -hmm. alpha reductase, then what would happen? This patient would have excessive DHT once again, high testosterone. Mm -hmm. So this yeah. is not the one. What is the next answer option? Luteinizing hormone. Luteinizing hormone. If luteinizing hormone was the one, then once again, leading cell should have been functioning more and increased testosterone. So the thing is, this patient has no signs symptoms of high testosterone. Right. This patient has mm -hmm. a simple nodule, and if Sertoli cells are responsible for, for creating Mullein inhibiting factor, they're also responsible for the degeneration of the paramesonephric duct. And paramesonephric ducts, when they degenerate, they form an appendix testis, which is a remnant. We we'll call this appendix testis. Appendix, appendix testis can stay asymptomatic, but sometimes mm -hmm. they can get uh, devoid of blood supply and they can get necrotic. That can produce excessive amount of pain. And that's what the present, that's what the patient presented to you, to you with. It presented to you with a Gardner's cyst. I mean, with an appendix um, cyst. Okay. Dr. Head, uh, the, it's, the it's difficult for me to remember I the certainly what the certainly cell produce, what the labic cell produce. Also, I have some, uh, you know, for you to remember, okay, difficult for you to remember. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this easy. Number one, labic cell makes you large, L for labic, L for large. Not late, large. Yeah, okay. What All what right. hormone makes you large? Testosterone. All right. Okay. okay. FSH contains S, works on Sertoli cells. FSH will produce okay. inhibit, as simple as that. Okay. Okay. What else do you have? What 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 other problem do you have? Uh, the granulosa theca luteal cells in the female system. That is also very difficult for me. And am theca I cells, they produce testosterone. Granulosa cell, um, my apologies. Theca cells, they uh, work with increased activity of luteinizing hormone. Yeah. Granulosa cell, they work with increased activity of the FSH. 
Uh, how can you do, remember this? Luteinizing hormone to produces testosterone, it's LT. So luteinizing hormone works on Tika cells, LT. So that leaves you with granulosa cell that will work with FSH. Yeah. Okay. And in pre, uh, luteinizing hormone work on the Tika cell and produce estrogen, right? Not, est uh, not estrogen, androstenedione. Androstenedione goes from Tika cells to granulosa cells. Then granulosa yeah. cells convert yeah. androstenedione to estrogen. Okay. All right, thank you so much. Okay. And I will okay. also go through all the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the phenotype and the genotype regarding the sexual thing. It is also very difficult for me to remember all those. Uh, you okay. know, so you do how, another how review. See, yeah. Yes, you do another review. Let me know if you need anything. I'm going to ask you questions in the class. And that's all right. It. Okay, thank that's you so much. You're welcome. Does anyone else have any other questions? Does anyone else have any other questions? It's just mostly like, um, yeah. Okay. okay. So thank you so much, guys. If you guys have friends who wants to come and join the lecture, please let them know that we take two classes, one in the morning, one in the evening. They can come and join whenever they want for free classes. And I hope you guys all the best. I wish you guys all the best. And I'll see you guys tomorrow at 10 a.m. Okay, bye-bye. Right, because they know that if they right. <laughs> Exactly.